Fighting stuff out. Things have been a little alarming today. I found out the snack I was eating was poisonous. I'm eating poison? Fortunately, I remained calm. Okay, maybe not so calm, but turns out I was fine. Sort of a funny story. I read grapes are poisonous, but I didn't finish reading the sentence. Turns out they're poisonous to dogs, but they're totally healthy to us people. Ooh. Wait, how can something I eat be poisonous to my dog? I mean, poison's poison, right? You know what else is poisonous to pets? Chocolate, raisins, avocado, gum, garlic, walnuts. Shouldn't we be able to eat the same foods? It's not like I would die if I ate a dog biscuit. Or would I? So confusing! Ah! Yay. You're gonna make my head explode! I'm determined to get to the bottom of this mystery. Maybe Maxim's question will help. What exactly is poison? The short answer is, I don't know. Poison seems more complicated than I realized. But by the end of the show, I'll have the answer. Meanwhile, here's another question. Why are some frogs poisonous? Well, Tegan, let's find out. He's an expert on animals that poison and bite, so I guarantee it'll be a delight. Please welcome Jesse DeLuca. Hi, Zoe. Hi. Wow, the frog is so colorful. It looks like it's made out of candy. But you don't want him in your trick-or-treat bag. He's poisonous. I've never seen a frog like this. What kind of frog is it? This is a poison dart frog from South America. It gets its name because hunters used to use its poison on the tips of their darts. Poison dart frogs have some of the most brilliant and beautiful colors on Earth, but they are also the deadliest creatures on Earth. The golden dart frog, for instance, is known to be ounce for ounce the most toxic animal on the planet. Its poison is so powerful, only one drop can kill 10,000 mice. That's like 10 to 20 grown humans. Yikes! So how dangerous is this guy? Well, I was only kidding earlier. It's not poisonous at all. If it was in nature and eating the stinging insects that it usually eats, then it would be poisonous. For example, if he was eating little stinging ants, the stinging chemicals in their venom makes them poisonous. So what do you feed them then? I feed them little fruit flies and little tiny crickets. <laughs> Why are some types of frogs poisonous and others aren't? Some frogs evolve to be poisonous and predators learn not to eat them. That seems like a big advantage. Why don't other frogs have that? Well, some frogs are poisonous, and then there's others that evolve to camouflage. I believe that frogs become poisonous due to the environment they live in and the food that is found there. Cool. I have a question I think you can answer. Why doesn't the poison in the scorpion kill the scorpion? Well, Vulcan, you think I'm going to have a live scorpion on my show? Well, you're right. This is an emperor scorpion. Is the poison in its claws or its tail? It's actually in its tail, and it's not poison, it's venom. What's the difference? Poison is something that an animal has to help protect itself. If you eat it, you'll get sick. So what's venom? Venom is something that an animal has to kill its prey. The venom has to get into your blood. Just think of the frog and how its poison is for defense, and the scorpion has its venom for attack. Defense versus offense. I think I feel a song coming on. D, D, defense. You can't eat me. Oh, oh, offense. I'm so hungry. If you want a piece of this, I'm in the mood, the mood. 
to pitch. If you want a piece of this, I will make you really sick. If you try to take a bite, then you might be dead tonight. With my venom, I'll attack. I will paralyze the snack. But I won't eat you today. You're not tasty anyway. Yay! Tea! <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Sometimes I just feel a little musical. No problem. So how does the scorpion actually use its venom? The scorpion uses its venom with its stinger. It stings its prey to paralyze it. What would happen if it accidentally stung itself? Some scorpions have anti-venom in their bloodstream that prevents them from getting hurt from stinging themselves. But if too much venom is released, it can end up killing itself. Wait, if it stung me, would it kill me? Scorpions can kill small animals. There's only a few scorpions that can actually kill humans. Oh, phew. But if you were to get stung, it would affect you. It would hurt. That reminds me of another question I got. Can you hold a tarantula without being bitten? Well, Anjali, we're about to find out. It's actually best not to hold a tarantula. This is a Brazilian black tarantula. I'm going to guess it has venom instead of poison. That's right, it has venom. It uses its venom to inject its prey to paralyze it. This one actually doesn't spin any webs, it hunts down its prey. Do all spiders have venom? Because they don't have teeth, yes, all spiders do have venom. But their venom isn't very strong on humans. It's more like a wasp or a bee sting. Yikes. Ask a friend. What would you do if you saw a tarantula or a scorpion? Run for your life. I would faint. I would take a stick and get it off. I would scream and cry and run away. Kick it off my leg and then squash it. I would have a heart attack. I would shout, ah, tarantula! How can we actually avoid being stung? You just want to leave it alone. If you don't bother it, it won't bother you. So if you held the tarantula, would it automatically use its venom on you? It might, but it doesn't want to use up its venom. It doesn't have an unlimited amount. Well, thanks for helping me find stuff out. My pleasure. So tarantulas have to be careful not to use all their venom. Hey, that gives me an idea for... My Great Challenge! Welcome to the Great Tarantula Challenge! Hope you're hungry. Today's challenges are... Dogio! And Alessandro! I hope you're not scared of spiders. You're going to be tarantulas. You each have giant venom squirters. You have to knock over your prey by squirting water. I mean venom at it. But be careful, because you don't want to hit anything that tarantulas don't eat. Don't use too much venom, because when you run out of venom, you're done. Are you ready? Yeah! Okay, Dario, you'll go first. On your mark, get set, attack! Dario's going for an all-out attack. Ladybug. Yep, tarantulas eat mostly insects. Pretty much any insect they can catch. Even flies, mosquitoes, or bees. They are all delicious. More venom pressure. Not easy to catch your lunch now, is it? Dario was lucky he didn't knock down that robot. Tarantula, do not eat robots. Looks like you're running out of venom, Dario. Dario got 10 snacks. Let's see if Alessandra can beat him. Almost got it. Nice, you caught a butterfly. A mouse. That's good for one point. Some species of tarantulas will actually eat mice, frogs, or even birds. Nope, you lose a point. Tarantulas do not eat flowers. Hey, I'm not a bug. Okay, Alessandra, it looks like you ran out of venom. Let's see who won. So, Alessandra, you knocked eight prey down. Yes. 
And Dario, you knocked Ted Ray down, so you win! Yes! Thanks for playing. Oh, and because the challenge probably made you hungry, here's a snack. Oh, bugs! Well, that's an easy prey. And here's another question from Emanuela that you can sink your teeth into. How come some snakes are poisonous and others are not? Ha! You can't fool me. Snakes can be venomous, but they're not poisonous. If they were poisonous, you'd get sick from eating them. And some people eat rattlesnake. I checked whether snakes have venom or not. Depends on how they catch their food. Some snakes don't need venom at all because they catch their prey by squeezing it until it suffocates. Imagine if you had to squeeze your lunch like that. But other snakes use venom spikes to paralyze their prey and sometimes to pre-digest it. I wonder what that looks like. Kiana and Maxim have an experiment to find out. This experiment shows sort of what snake venom can do to your blood. First, you add some red food coloring to milk. That looks like blood, except it's like lighter. Yep. Then you add vinegar and see what happens. Oh my gosh. That oh looks very, God. very, very weird. It's all separated like into little bubbles in its own section. It looks like a sponge. Yeah, it does. The vinegar clots the milk, so it's all globby and yucky. That's sort of what snake venom does to the blood of its prey. That's disgusting. <laughs> I wish I never had to see that. That looked disgusting. Are you sure you want to eat that? Okay. Thanks, Kiana and Maxim. Bye, Bye Zoe. <laughs> Why can't we ever have pizza? <laughs> Fortunately for us humans, scientists have found a ways to make medicine called anti-venom. I found out they milk snakes for their venom to make anti-venom. They can save you from a snake bite if you get the medicine in time. <laughs> snakes a lot. <laughs> How can they eat poisoned food? Hmm, why would I want to? Well, turns out some people do want to. I found out that the pufferfish is poisonous to keep bigger animals from eating it. You know, in case the spikes aren't enough reason to find a different lunch. But chefs in Japan have a special way of preparing pufferfish that gets the poison out. There's just a teeny little bit left to make your mouth feel stingy. But if the chef makes a mistake, it can kill you. To me, that doesn't seem worth the risk. But all around the world, people have discovered ways to eat poisonous food safely. I found out that in South America, they make flour from a plant called manioc, or cassava, which is super poisonous. To make it safe, first you have to scrape it, soak it, boil it, grind it into flour, and then cook it. That's a lot of work. Cassava is one of the most popular starchy foods in places near the equator, but it's poisonous if it's not prepared right. Even foods we find in the grocery store can be poisonous, like the leaves of rhubarb and potatoes. And speaking of foods we need to be careful about, how do we know if a mushroom is poisonous? <laughs> There are lots of old wives' tales about when mushrooms are safe to eat. I should know. I'm an old wife. <laughs> I've heard that if they grow on wood, it's safe. As long as it's not red, it's fine. Rub the red off, it's safe to eat. You know, 
know what? Uh, maybe I should check this. <laughs> People used to have all sorts of rules about how to tell if a mushroom was poisonous. But those rules were only right some of the time. And if you weren't right... I should have checked. Aww. To find out more about poisonous mushrooms, I'm on the hunt for them with mushroom expert Mary Burby and some of her students, Vivian and Anna. What kind of poisonous mushrooms can we find? Well, I can show you some of the pictures of poisonous mushrooms that have made people sick in this area. Sure. So this is the death cap here. And this is the destroying angel. Death cap, destroying angel? I can tell by those names that they're trouble. <laughs> you are so right. The reason why they have those names is because if you eat a relatively small amount, like two mushrooms, then the poisons in the mushroom can completely destroy your liver. And fairly frequently, they die. So if there's any group of mushrooms that you should learn to recognize by sight, it's the death caps and destroying angels. So you can always avoid those very carefully. <laughs> yeah. Ho! We're going on a treasure hunt for poison! Here, mushroom, mushroom, mushroom. There's one. Oh, good job. That's really cool. Isn't it, though? What's this? Whoa, nice find. That's a mushroom called the prince. Poison or lunch? It is, in fact, lunch. Horror, I'll put you in the treasure chest. If I were to collect mushrooms in the wood by myself, how would I tell if the mushroom's okay? There are probably 30,000 different kinds of mushrooms and some are poisonous and some aren't, and the only way to know which is which is to get to know the individual kinds very well. One way that people often learn to do that is by going out with groups of experts. So they go out with mushroom clubs who have a lot of experience picking and identifying mushrooms. If I were to eat a poisonous mushroom, what would happen? Well, I hope you never do, because it's not a pleasant experience. What your parents would probably do is to take you to the hospital and they'd pump your stomach, which is not pleasant, but that would get rid of the poisons. The mushrooms that cause the most serious problem are the ones where you can't tell that you've eaten something bad for a long time, so it takes hours before you start to get sick. And by that time, there's not anything that they can do by way of pumping your stomach, because the poison is all throughout your body. And that's the problem with the death caps and the destroying angels. So I really hope you never get anywhere near those kinds of fungi. Okay, I'm convinced. I'm <laughs> glad you're here to help. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> we found a lot of mushrooms, but no death cap or destroying angels. And I want to see real ones. So Mary brings me to the Beatty Biodiversity Museum to see their huge mushroom collection. Shiver me timbers! Look at all these treasures! <laughs> That's the right attitude. They are indeed <laughs> treasures, and they're preserved here so that scientists all over the world can study them. Why are they all dry? The reason why they're dry is because a fresh mushroom only lasts about two or three days, and then it becomes just a mass of slime. So the only way to keep specimens so that scientists can study them in the future is to dry them down. There's some that actually go back older than your grandparents are. Some mushrooms have distinctive smells. You want to smell a death cap? Sure. Anna and Vivian said that the death cap, when it's dried, has a particularly disgusting smell. What do you think? Is sure. that disgusting? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Take a look at this one here, because okay. this is the one that's deadly poisonous. And one of the characteristics of the death cap is that it's got this cup. So the stem of the mushroom actually comes from inside of a sort of a cup. And if you see a mushroom that has a cup like that, don't eat it, okay? Because most poisonous mushrooms of all have that characteristic. Thanks for helping me find stuff out. Arr. No problem, matey. Don't forget your treasure. <laughs> I'm gonna eat you. If the frog's red, you'll end up dead. Uh, maybe I'll eat your canola bar instead. <laughs> Good idea. No one wants to eat something poisonous. Hey, I think that's the answer to today's big question. What exactly is poison?
the answer is... Poison and venom are substances that help animals survive. The dart frog's poison keeps animals from eating it. So does the puffer fish's poison. Though chefs have learned to outsmart it. I found out that even plants use poison to protect themselves. Like foxglove, which is extremely poisonous if you swallow it. And if you think about it, even animals that use venom to attack are using it for survival. Their venom helps them kill their prey. And they use the threat of venom to scare us away. I'm definitely going to stay away from poison. Except for these green grapes. After all, I'm not a dog. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. Oh, hey, um, I'm a bit dirty. I'm making pies. Well, actually mud pies. I wonder if I could eat a mud pie. That reminds me of a great question I got. Oh, uh... <gasps> Is dirt bad for you? Maybe it's bad for me. I don't know the answer, but maybe your questions about dirt will help me figure it out. Here's a question from Ethan. Why do you have to take a bath? A flat earth corner! Bathing? Taking a bath? That's a quick turn to sickville. Ew! Why? I've known quite a few people who have died because of baths, so I would never, ever chance bathing. Unless I was healthy enough for a full fortnight. You do need to smell nice, though. So, we'll just add a little bit more mud and a nice spritz of this. Now I'm ready for the ball. Maybe just a bit more mud to get rid of the cold. <laughs> In the Middle Ages, people really thought taking a bath was bad for you and would spread diseases. It's kind of how we think of dirt today, actually. But dirt can't be that bad on you, can it? I mean, some people actually take mud baths at fancy spas. So no need for me to take a bath to wash this mud off, right? Wait a second, dirt can contain what? That's right, there's insect poop in dirt. Gross, so who would want to take a bath in all of this? Huh, it turns out the kind of mud they use for mud baths is different from regular mud. Okay, so maybe we do need to take baths and I should take one, don't go away. <laughs> now that I'm nice and clean, I'm ready to answer this great question from Marina. Are dirt and soil the same thing? Uh-oh, do try this at home. To answer your question, Marina, dirt is what makes things dirty. So it can be soil and it can be dust. Pick up some dust around your house and compare it to the soil in your plants. Soil is a kind of dirt that helps plants grow. But dust is something different. Dust is made of stuff that floats in through the air like pollen, pet hair, and carpet fibers, along with some of the dirt you track in from outside. But you can't grow plants in dust. Soil is heavy and clumpy, and it's filled with lots of things that make it possible for plants to grow. It turns out plants actually like to eat stuff like rotting leaves and insect poop. Ooh, yum, yum. To each his own, I guess. Anyway, there are all different kinds of soil around the world, and they can be different colors. Hey, look. It's my gum. I thought I lost that last year. <laughs> I wonder if I can whip off the dirt off and eat it. <sighs> uh. Thankfully, Aaron has a question that can help me. If animals could eat dirt, why can't we? Wait a second. Animals eat dirt? Aaron is right. Some animals definitely eat dirt. They're called geophagic. Geo means dirt and phagic means to eat. Like I found out before, there are nutritious bugs in dirt, but along with those bugs, 
there are also parasites and bacteria. Things that usually don't make animals sick, but that could make you really sick if you eat them. Ew! I guess I shouldn't eat that. <laughs> Along with all that bad stuff, there are also lots of nutrients and dirt. Minerals like calcium and iron that help make animals strong. If certain animals don't eat dirt, they don't get the nutrients that help them survive and grow up strong. Okay. Even though eating dirt can make humans sick, we get important nutrients from it too. Except we get them by eating the plants that grow in dirt. Now here's a question from Kareem. Can you make stuff with dirt? To answer that, she makes cool things out of clay and she's our special guest today. Please welcome ceramic artist Kathy Reeves. Hey Zoe. Hi Kathy. Look what I brought you. These are pieces made of clay. Wow, beautiful. It's actually a kind of dirt, eh? Watch out, it's fragile. <laughs> well, I'll try not to crack you up. Get it? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, got it. <laughs> Whoa, what's this crazy spinning thing? This is a potter's wheel, and I'm gonna make a bowl with this clay. Hmm. So how does it get from this to this? That's a good question. I bake it in an oven, it comes out like this. Cool. Feel how it's hard? Yeah. And then I'll dip it in a glaze, which is like paint, yeah. and it goes back in the oven, which is called a kiln, to 2,000 degrees. Wow, that's hot. Here we go. I'm gonna wet my hands. I'm gonna open it up like a volcano. <laughs> now I'm gonna open up the piece to make it more like a bowl. Up we go. Doo, doo, doo. So that ball of clay is turning into something that you can use every day. So you can make something like this. Wow, that's so cool. I have magic fishing wire here. <laughs> and I'll slice it right off. And if you pass me that tile there, I'm gonna slide this on. Stick it right on there. I have to wait for it to dry completely. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna shrink, the water's gonna come out of the clay, it's gonna get smaller. And then once it's totally dry, I'll put it in that kiln. And then after about eight hours, it'll come out like this. The pottery, it uh, becomes like a rock when it's finished, solid, hard. And that's why we find clay pieces, shards in archeological sites from thousands and thousands of years ago. It's so durable. Now we get to see how Zoe does it. Okay, so you're gonna place your hands like a butterfly. And we're gonna try to lift it together and you'll make that like witchy, witchy poo hat. Put your hand on the top here and push that down. Okay, push down, push down. So your fingers are gonna go like, like this, slowly, slowly. So go out, back. Now it's ready to come off the wheel. Zoe, look what you did. <laughs> Proud. <laughs> so I'll take this back to my studio and trim it and glaze it for you so it's ready to go. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> Meanwhile, here's a question about things you can make with mud from Victoria. How do I make houses out of mud? I checked, and here's what I found out. Ancient Egyptians used sand, silt, and clay and mixed it with straw to make bricks. They would let the bricks dry in the sun and then they'd be ready. Why mud, you ask? Well, because it's easy to get. It's cheap and it's fireproof. Thick dirt walls also keep houses warm in winter and cool in summer. And you can build a whole house with only a few tools beside your own two hands. And the bricks are strong. Mud bricks can be as strong and as durable as stone. In Africa, some mud brick buildings have been standing for thousands of years. Today, some people still make houses out of mud, like these mud houses in Mali. And this kind of mud house called adobe found in the southwestern United States. I wonder if we can make bricks out of mud, like people did in the past. The experiment! We're gonna make mud bricks. Show me! For this experiment, Adriana and Ariane used some water, soil, straw, a container, and a milk carton. 
That mud seems muddy to me. It feels gooey. The straw will make the bricks more solid. Yeah, without straw, the bricks would crack and break more easily. Now it's the fun part, where you dump the mud in the milk carton. What's the next step? We're going to put it under the sun for a week so that it gets really hard. Well, these bricks were drying for one week. Are they strong enough to build with? Yep. We did it. That's awesome. Now you have to build a whole house. Are you joking? Just kidding. Thanks for showing me. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. That makes me have a question of my own. Ask, Ask a friend. friend. If you could build your dream house out of mud, what would it look like? It would be like a castle with like mud bricks. And it would be like a mud fountain squirting mud, but it's like edible mud. I would just live in the dirt so I wouldn't even have a shower. The bathroom would be all mud and when you sit on it, it would just stick to your bum. I'd like a mud house because I could get all the mud baths I ever wanted. And spa treatments. I wouldn't need any staircases because I can just slide on the mud. I would have a mud bed and by the morning I would be covered in mud on my back, but still, it'd still be fun. I would have pet pigs so they can roll around in the mud and I won't have to do a homework so I can tell my teacher my homework got all full of mud. Hey Zoe, look what I have. Whoa, is this the bowl we made? It sure is. So I made something out of dirt that I can actually eat out of. Yeah, and no bugs. <laughs> well, thanks for helping me find stuff out, Kathy. No problem, it was fun. Wow, this clay is really hard. I found out about another really hard clay called porcelain. It doesn't just make cool ceramics. It's used to make all kinds of things, like floor tiles, toilet bowls, and even false teeth. It's hard to believe this used to be all wet and slippery. Leia has a question about that. Why is mud so sticky? To answer your question, I'm here at the Tofino Mudflats. A mudflat is an area by the ocean covered by layers of mud that can be as deep as almost two meters. At high tide, it's all covered with water. I'm meeting Emily Fulton, a marine biologist. Hi, Zoe. Welcome to the Tofino Mudflats. Thanks for having me. This place is awesome. And sticky. I was hoping you could help me find the answer to Leah's question about why mud is so sticky and hard to walk on. Let's check it out. So what we see here is kind of a mix of silt and sand and water and organic matter all kind of held together. And it's pretty sticky, but believe it or not, if there's more clay and dirt in the sand, then it'll make the mud even stickier. Wow. So the stickiness of the mud has to do with the type of soils that make up and how much water is in it. Here, the tides cover the mud flats twice a day, so it's always sticky. But some soils that get very little water get super hard and definitely don't stick. Why does it smell so bad? Well, in the sand here, we have lots of bacteria, and that could make it kind of stinky. If you look down here, the really dark patches in the mud those are anoxic places, so there's no oxygen when you go deeper into the sand. And that's where the bacteria lives, and that's the stinky part. So you probably would not want to eat mud pies from here. If you ate one from here, it wouldn't hurt you, but it might not be very tasty. No thanks. I have another question. It's from Kenya. Do creatures live in the mud? There are thousands of creatures that live in the mud here. So all around us, you see all these tiny little holes in the mud? Yeah. Those are made from tiny creatures that are living underneath. I can see some little creatures by your boots here. Oh, yeah. So this is a ghost shrimp. They like to burrow into the mud. They're some of the ones that make all these little holes that we see. Wow, take a look at this. Wow. So this is a moon snail. The biggest kind of snail you're going to find around here. Wow, that's crazy. 
looks oh, like it's burrowing it back in. You can see. It is so gooey. They are really gooey. Oh, look at it, it's going in. These guys don't actually have eyes like we do. So when it feels us touching the side of it, it doesn't know if we're predators. It might think we're trying to eat it. So what is that beside it? Believe it or not, this is what a moon snail's eggs look like. Looks kind of like rubber, doesn't it? Uh -huh. And it feels kind of like rubber. So this is thousands and thousands and thousands of little tiny eggs squished between sand and mucus to protect them. Wow, well, there really are a lot of creature foods in this mud. Thanks for having me find stuff out. My pleasure, I had a lot of fun in the mud with you. But I can see the tides coming in, so it's probably a pretty good time to get going. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sinking! <laughs> Let's get you out of here. I can do it. I got a wiggle. I got a wiggle. I got it. Woo! High Ooh. five. That was a hard one. <laughs> that was fun. And I'm not the only one who likes to be in mud, as this question from Emma shows. Why do pigs love rolling in the mud so much? Let's ask an expert. Ask a pig. Sweet! I hate to be all clean and pink. I want to get in mud and sink. But summer I don't need a pool. Don't you want to roll in mud and stink? Don't you want to roll in mud and stink? Yeah! No thanks, but enjoy your mud bath. I found out other reasons pigs like to roll in mud. Sometimes there's pig food in it. In France, farmers use pigs to find mushroom-type things called truffles. Truffles grow in the dirt near the roots of trees, and they're super delicious. Chocolate truffles are totally different things. They're called that because they kind of look like truffles. But the rarest truffle is the mysterious white Alba truffle. Ooh. I found out that they cost thousands of dollars a kilogram. So when the pigs are truffle hunting, they're looking for buried treasure. Ah, buried treasure. Arr, did someone say buried treasure? Yoink. <laughs> And that gives me an idea for... My Great Challenge! Today's challengers are... Pig Ella, oink oink, and Pig Megan. Today, you're gonna be truffle pigs. Now, these aren't real truffles, but we'll pretend they are. There are a bunch of these hidden in the mud. The challenge is, you have to dig your face in the mud, and then once you find a truffle, you have to pick it up with your mouth. Ew! No! No! Just kidding. You're gonna use your hands. Okay, on your marks, get that, go! <laughs> Come on! <laughs> dig, dig, dig! <laughs> you gotta look everywhere. They're hidden all over the mud. Like in the corners. <laughs> Keep looking, you guys! Keep going! <laughs> You guys gotta dig faster and harder. Come on. Oink, oh, oink. you found one. Good job. <laughs> you find anything? Yes. Yeah, good job, Ella. Maybe try looking in the corners. <laughs> find one? Good job. <laughs> oink, oink. <laughs> good job, Megan. Yeah. Piggies, stop fooling around and dig up those truffles. These pigs must be in heaven. Oink, oink. Oh, good job, Megan. Oink, oink. Good job. <laughs> 10 seconds left. 10, <laughs> nine, eight, seven, six, five. What's that hedgehog doing there? <laughs> Four, three, two, one. Okay, time's up, you guys. Bring me your bucket. <laughs> Okay, Ella, let's 
see how many you got. You got two. Good job. Okay, Megan. Let's see how many you got. You got five and a hedgehog. So you won. Good job. <laughs> Next question. Is there dirt everywhere in the universe? Mmm, yummy cheese. <laughs> Well, Juliet, I checked, and lots of planets we know have their own kind of dirt, like this red dirt from Mars. But I found out something even more amazing. There's stardust from exploding stars all over the universe. Some of the stardust is in dirt and even in our own bodies. Turns out our bodies and dirt have something in common. So I think I finally know how to answer Nayla's question. Is dirt bad for you? The big answer is... Yes and no. Dirt is bad for you in some ways. We shouldn't really eat mud pies. There are things in dirt that can be unhealthy, but we also need dirt. We grow our fruits and vegetables in dirt, we make all kinds of useful things with dirt, and our bodies need some of the minerals that are in dirt. In a way, our bodies are partly made out of dirt. We couldn't live without it. So I guess, because I'm already part dirt, I might as well go out and play in the mud, right? See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. <sighs> I wish you could smell these, because they inspired this beautiful show. The how do flowers poop? <laughs> well, Jacob, I never really thought of that. Now that you're asking, I think I'm gonna stop sniffing those flowers until I find out the answer. Well, I don't know how flowers poop, or even if they do, but thanks for giving me an excuse to do a show on, well, you know. Why is bird poop white? <laughs> Here's the first thing I noticed about those bird droppings. I noticed that these bird droppings are very runny compared to regular human, well, you know. <laughs> I can't believe what I just found out. Birds poo and pee at the same time. The white part is the pee, and the little black parts you see in it are the poop. So, if you get splatted on by a bird, remember, the bird isn't just pooping on you, it's peeing on you too. Now here's a question from Sophia. What animal does the biggest poop? I checked, and there are some champion poopers out there. This is a moose-sized poop. And this is a hippo-sized poop. But it doesn't come out neat like this. It goes all over the place like it was shot out of a cannon. And there's an animal that makes even bigger poop than the hippo. The blue whale. And I found out its poop is reddish-orange because of the orange seafood it eats. And its poop is so big, I don't even have enough clay to show you the amount of poop. It makes so much poop in one day, it weighs the amount of a baby elephant. That's enough to fill an Olympic swimming pool every year. Hey, cannonball! Ew! Who let the whale in the pool? So remember, never swim behind a blue whale. Now here's a question from Madison. What happens to poop after a century? To find out, Please welcome my special guest, paleontologist, Jordan Mallon. Hey. Hi, Harrison. I, uh, I brought something for you. Cool. A rock. Well, actually, it's a piece of dinosaur poop. Ew, you had me poop? Yeah, only the best for you. Oh, OK. How old is all this poop here? It's pretty old. It's actually millions of years old. Millions? Well, that's definitely more than a century. So what happens to this poop? Well, normally, poop will degrade. But in this case, we have some examples of some fossilized poop. That is poop that has been replaced by minerals over millions of years. So they're like rocks now. Yeah. What is this one? This one's so big. Like... It's actually a piece of T-Rex poop. Um, the only example of its kind in existence. Can I touch it? Absolutely. <laughs> it's so weird looking. <laughs> How does it like become like this? What happens is most of this fossilized poop comes from carnivores. And the reason being that carnivores usually eat a lot of bone. 
and the minerals in that bone allow the poop to be fossilized more easily. So most of the fossil poop that we have in the fossil record is from carnivores. The poop herbivore dinos made was runnier and softer than carnivore poop, so it decomposed and disappeared faster. You have to be very lucky to find fossilized herbivore poop. The really interesting thing about herbivores is they have to eat plants all day long in order to get enough food, enough nutrition. Because they're always digesting this plant material, their stomachs are constantly producing nauseous gas called methane. Basically, these animals poop all day long, and they would have been quite stinky to see back 65 million years ago. <laughs> but at least they don't stink now. Well, why don't you take a smell for yourself? <laughs> I hope it doesn't stink. It smells fine. It smells great. <laughs> it's basically just rock. Thanks for being on my show and showing me all of this poop. <laughs> it was my pleasure, Harrison. Thanks for having me on. And while we're on the subject of stinky stuff, let's get some... <laughs> Today, we're in a bathroom to talk about farts. So you've all farted before, right? Yeah! OK, so I'm going to ask you, what makes you fart? Anything. <laughs> Asparagus. <laughs> And oh goes. my gosh. When he farts, you can literally see the green gas. <laughs> no she is the worst. <laughs> I don't fart. I can fart on command. Don't do it. No. 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 Anything unhealthy, really? <laughs> Just beans. Cake, peanut butter and jam sandwiches, and sometimes milk. And what did you just eat? Peanut butter and jam sandwiches. To drink, I had a glass of milk. Oh. Sorry. I'm still trying to get to the bottom of all your questions. Here's another. Why do people poop? I'm glad you asked, Olivia, because it gives me a chance to replay one of my favorite Finding Stuff Out songs. What happens to our food? Well, if it tastes good, first we chew, then we swallow. Down to our stomachs, where it's hollow. Enzymes there, break it down. When they're done, it gets passed around to the small intestine, seven meters long, takes nutrients out to make us strong. The large intestine absorbs the water, just like a giant paper blotter. And that, my peeps, is the scoop. And what we can't use turns into poop. Yeah, what we can't use turns into poop. You may have remembered this from the show where I answered your questions about food. But there's more to the story about why we need to poop. Other stuff that we can't use comes out in our daily food. Bacteria is part of that waste. Dead cells that our body replaced and fiber from the plants we ate. But water makes up most of the waste. That's why. But sometimes how doesn't go so smoothly. Here's a question from Catherine. How does a person become constipated? <laughs> Do you ever have that problem? I guess I'll never know, because you can't talk. Well, this is how it happens to people. Some foods have fiber, which we can't digest. But even though our body can't digest it, fiber is still important because it tickles the lining of our intestines. Good <laughs> But foods without fiber, like cheese and meat, don't tickle our intestines, so they can sit there a long time. And while they're sitting there, our bowels draw water out of them, making them drier and harder, which is why it can hurt to get constipated. So eat lots of food with fiber in them, and also... Uh-oh, dude, try this at home. I checked, and besides eating high fiber food, there's something else you can do to help you if you get constipated. Drink a glass of water to help soften your poop, and do some light exercises to help get those bowels moving. But maybe don't do both at the same time. Uh-oh. I'll be right back. Meanwhile, here's a question from Adriana. When you eat corn, why when you poop, it comes out? 
to find out the answer to your question, I've come deep into the woods. And to help me is wildlife biologist, Dr. Murray Humphreys. Hi, Harrison. How are you doing? Welcome to my show. Glad to be here. So, is your job really studying poop? Well, yeah, I study wildlife, and a great way to learn about wildlife is to study their poop. It's one of the ways we can tell what animals have been eating, because anything that's left undigested shows up in their poop. Maybe like corn or something. You got it. Just like corn. And hey, look right there. I see some poop. Oh, <laughs> whoa. So what kind of animal do you think left this, Harrison? Looks like it could be a rabbit or something. Well, a rabbit would be perfectly round, but you see how it's a bit oval? That yeah. That means it's been left by a white-tailed deer. Put this on. A mask? What is this for? Well, we got to pick this poop up, Harrison. What? Ew. And before you pick up the poop, you want to put a mask on. There's some dangerous stuff in animal poop, and you don't want to get it in your mouth. Just so we don't get sick. That's right. There we go. And That's just great. There. Oh, wonderful. We'll find some other poop and the next one you're gonna pick up, Harrison. What? That's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be magical. Time to find some poop. Could be anywhere, eh? Yeah. What's that right there, Harrison? Oh, that's a huge poop. Has to be something big, like maybe a bear. You got it, that's a bear poop. It's not even a big bear poop. They can be huge. Well, I guess I should put my mask on. Go for it, Harrison. Let's pick it up. up. This poop. Uh, which piece should I grab? Oh, get as much as you can. Oh, it's all warm. <laughs> oh, this is so gross. <laughs> oh, perfect. Got I'll it. take that from you. Yeah, you can take care of that. Can't wait to see what this guy's been eating. Put it in there. Keep it safe. <laughs> safe. We'll find one more, huh? One more. Let's go find right. some poop. Let's go looking. Right there, more poop. Oh, look at that one. That's <laughs> a beauty. You can pick it up this time. You're the pro. Okay, that's a coyote poop. I'm sure of it. But we'll go take it back to the lab, have a closer look. Awesome. But away we go. Let's go. So let's start with the coyote. It's kind of the biggest bones and obvious here. Anytime you look at a bone like that, it's pretty hard to tell where that's from, what kind of animal. But yeah. the best thing is if you can happen to find some teeth. Oh, okay. there's a couple right there. Look at those teeth right there, huh? So we'll be able to tell what he's eating. Yeah, the teeth are a lot more characteristic of which mammal it's from. I think that must be from a squirrel. So now we know the coyote's been eating squirrels. You've got it. If we take a look at the, uh, the bear. bear next, why don't you take a look at this one? See if you can poke in there. It gets a little smaller. Bears aren't likely to yeah. be eating things with big there's bones. No, yeah, there's bones. no bones in here. But you see the grass, and maybe you see some berries, and it means they eat all sorts of stuff. Right, like and now the deer. The deer, it's actually the hardest to tell because we know a deer is a herbivore. It <laughs> only eats plant matter and plants are pretty hard to see. They don't stick out like big bones or anything. Yeah. So you gotta look a little closer for that. So we take a little piece and then get it underneath the microscope. Have a look and see what you see. Oh, well, it's just like particles it's, and stuff. Yeah, a bunch of what we call it is cell walls. You just see the undigestible part of the plants that are left. Right. And each of those walls has a characteristic shape. So depending on what it looks like, that's how you know what type of plant it is. Exactly. Was it eating willows or alders or what kind of tree or what kind of shrub or what kind of flower was it eating? So I guess analyzing poop like this is pretty important. It really is. It tells you a lot about an animal. It tells you what they eat, their health, are they in good condition or bad. It can even tell you whether they're endangered or not. So you really learn a lot. Wow. Well, thanks so much for helping me find stuff out. It's great. It's a pleasure to meet you, Harrison. And this gives me an idea for... My Great Challenge! Today, my challengers are team number one, Stefano and Joey. Hello. And we also have team number two, Lily and Sabia. Hi. So, do you know what's under these plates? A sugar cream pie. Candy. You're all wrong, but today your challenge is to figure out what kind of animals that <laughs> this poop belongs to. It's either going to be a herbivore, an animal that eats plants, a carnivore, an animal that eats meat, or an omnivore. That's an animal that eats both. Oh, but it's not real poop. It's my poop. <laughs> I mean, poop that I made. To make my fake poop, I mix some water, brown food coloring, vegetable oil, salt, and flour. Just stir the whole thing and squish it with your hands until it looks like really nice poop. You'll have to dig through the poop to figure out what kind of animal it is. Okay. Sound good? So team one, you're up first. Team two, you'll have to go downstairs to the bathroom. Oh. Make yourself comfortable. Are you guys ready? Yeah! All right, here's the first poop for you to dig into. Ew! Oh, well. Oh, well. Let's go, Joe. Oh, oh, I see something, I see something. Oh, it's a bone. What about this type of? Hey, this one looks like whiskers. Must have ate a bunny or a cat. Uh, carnivore. That's right. That fake poop is supposed to be wolf poop. What? And wolves are carnivores. One, two, three, go. <gasps> oh, I've seen this one before. Got something, got something. It's me. Oh. 
What does it look like, ribs? This is fish. Mm. I think it's an omnivore. Omnivore, that's right, and it's from a bear. Bears eat lots of different kinds of food, including berries and fish, so I put that in my fake bear poop. Ready, go. go. Oh. Uh -huh. I got something, I got something. Enjoy, we're, we're going on something. Oh, piece of grass. Herbivore. That's also right. Oh, wow. Number three. <laughs> oh, Joey! <laughs> this fake poop is supposed to look like horse poop. It really oh. does. <laughs> yeah. Ready? Go. What? Out of the way, Joe. Oh! It eats bugs. This looks like seeds. I wonder what it could be. I think I got it. I think it's an omnivore. You're right, it's a raccoon. I love raccoon. Raccoons eat all kinds of weird things, including what is in our garbage cans. In this fake poop, there's a mix of seeds, nuts, and crickets. <laughs> oh, wow, we're pretty good at guessing. <laughs> Got you back, woohoo! Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Okay, here's your first poop to dig into. <laughs> okay. Since we found all the bones, we think it's the um, carnivore. You're right. It's fake wolf poop. <laughs> Go. Oh, this one. Oh, this is disgusting. <laughs> Ew. 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 Are those fish bones? Ew. Oh. Look. Oh. A cranberry or something? It's a fruit. Carnivore? That's right. It's fake bear poop. Oh! Go for it. <laughs> oh. oh! Grass? Grass? I think we guessed already. already. Herbivore? That's right, it's a herbivore. Oh. And this is a uh, horse poop. <gasps> no! Oh. <laughs> Ew! Here we go. What is this? I don't know. <gasps> is that a bug? <laughs> I see. Nuts. An omnivore? Yes, it's an omnivore. And it's fake raccoon poop. <gasps> oh, okay, that's disgusting. <laughs> okay, so the winner is team one. Yeah! And team two. Yeah! It's a tie. Oh, wow. All this poop makes me think of a question I got from Dante. Can poop be recycled? Ugh. <laughs> the Flat Earth Corner. Can it be recycled? Big time. Here in ancient Egypt, we astronomers know all about that. The ancient Egyptians saw that dung beetles recycled poop by eating it and even laying their eggs in it to give new dung beetles the energy to grow. When the ancient Egyptians saw that dung beetles could move balls of poop across the land, they concluded the dung beetle must be the power that makes the sun move across the sky. To them, the dung beetle was sacred and was the god of the rising sun. It renewed the sun every day before rolling it above the horizon, then carried it through the other world after sunset. They actually thought a mystical dung beetle named Capri carried the sun from the other world every morning and took it back there every night. So their scientific method wasn't perfect. <laughs> the ancient Egyptians were wrong about dung beetles making the sun move across the sky but there was a connection between the two. The sun is the source of the energy that makes plants grow. Animals eat the plants, then poop out the dung, which the dung beetle uses for food for itself and its babies. So yeah, poop gets recycled in a lot of different ways, but here are some of the weirdest. These wild civet cats eat beans from the coffee tree, then poop them out. People harvest those pooped out beans to make a unique kind of coffee called Kopi Luwak. It's the most expensive in the world. And there's even a toilet that turns our poop into energy. It's called the Luat. It's modeled from 90% horse poop. It doesn't use any water, and the human poop that gets collected in it is turned into energy. In Germany and lots of other countries, thousands of power plants transform the methane gas in animal and human poop into electricity. Poop is actually becoming an important source of energy. I'm an important source of energy. No. You 
can even live in dung. Cow dung can be recycled into bricks to build houses with. They're lighter and stronger than regular clay bricks. Animal scat is also used for paper. Like this notepad. It was made from elephant poo. I'll never forget that. And some people even think they can make you beautiful. In Japan, seagull droppings are used in face cream. I know what you're thinking. Seagull droppings really do give you nice skin. Just kidding. It's just normal moisturizer. You didn't think I was gonna actually put poop on my face, would you? Here's another question. This one's from Sydney. Why can you eat food, but then since poo's made out of food, then you can't eat poo? You're right that humans can eat poop. Here's why. Bacteria in our intestines, that's the part down here, are perfectly safe down there. But the bacteria come out of our bodies and poop. And if they get into other parts of our body, like our mouth, they could make us really, really sick. That's why it's so important to wash your hands with soap after you go to the bathroom. But you want to hear something really gross? I found out there's an Italian type of cheese called panaroni that's made by mixing milk with cow poop. The cow poop helps turn the milk into cheese. Fortunately, the heat it takes to make the cheese kills the bacteria in the poop that might otherwise make us sick. Gorillas actually do eat their own poop to get extra nutrients that they missed the first time. Unlike us, they don't get sick from it. Just thinking about that makes me feel really, really sick. But gorillas aren't the only ones. Plants like fertilizer made from animal dung. It has nutrients that help them grow. Yeah, you do like poop, don't you? But do you make your own? Well, it's time to answer the question that led us through the bowels of science. So how do flowers poop? <laughs> The big answer is... Quietly. All living things make waste, whether they're a tiny insect or a giant blue whale. Flowers make waste too, but not poop like us. Some of their waste comes out in sap and sticky goo called resins. And some of what is waste to them is actually useful to us. Like the oxygen that we breathe. But plant waste doesn't have the same gases in it as our poop does so it actually smells good. Well, that's the end of my show. See you next time for more. Dad, couldn't you wait until after the credits roll? Ah, I missed again. I really have to work on my aim. This is my little robot, Roland. He finishes the job for me. I'm controlling him like he's my little robotic assistant. Mwahaha! I am the puppet master, and you will do as I say. Controlling a robot like this is really handy. But what if it was attached to my body? I found out that people can get artificial body parts if they were born without an arm, or a leg, or lost one in an accident, or because of illness. They're called prosthetics. But I don't think they're robots like Roland. No way. This question from Jada is what got me thinking. Do prosthetics make you bionic? Bionic? You mean like having superpowers? I'd love to be bionic, wouldn't you? Cool. Not to worry, Captain, I gotcha. I'm stronger, faster, super bionic, Zoe! Jada, I'm not sure prosthetics give us super bionic powers, but I promise to use my super finding stuff out powers to get the answer. I'll start with this question from Massimo. How does it feel to get prosthetic limbs? To answer that, I have a special guest today. Her name is Megan, so please say hey. Welcome to my show. Hi, Zoe. I can answer all your questions by showing you my prosthetic legs. Oh, you have two prosthetic legs, but you walk so well. Nothing stops me. <laughs> when did you get your prosthetics? When I was two, I got a sickness called meningitis, and I had to amputate my two legs and nine fingers. A year later, when I was three, I got my prosthetic legs. It hurt at first, but once I got comfortable, I was actually proud. <laughs> Here's something Tristan wants to know. Does a prosthetic hurt? 
Yeah, does a prosthetic hurt? No, because it, it's fitted for me. If there's anything that actually hurts, uh, they can switch it around. Are there any sports or things you can't do because of your prosthetics? My prosthetic legs don't stop me from doing anything. They help me do things. My favorite sports are basketball and snowboard. What other sports and activities do you do? I kneeboard. I go on tube, <laughs> tubing. I have a bicycle fitted for me. That's cool. <laughs> I see you have other prosthetics here. Yeah, for the past year I've been wanting to wear high heels, but I couldn't because my regular prosthetic legs don't bend at the ankle. And we got these made that actually bend at the ankle. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Hey, I love your nail. Thank you, it's my only nail. I like to take care of it. <laughs> Is it hard to do other things without your nine other fingers? Well, I can text as fast as my friends can. <laughs> <laughs> that was fast. Do you have superpowers? No, I just get used to doing things my own way. <laughs> well, thanks for helping me find stuff out, Megan. No problem. It was fun. <laughs> yeah. The experiment! We're really lucky to have prosthetics to help people. My friends try to make one with straws. Hi, Andalina Nicholas. Hi, Hi Zoe. Zoe. I know you can't make real prosthetics like the ones Megan has. Right, but we can make a cool robotic hand using stuff from around the house. Go for it. We're gonna use five bendy straws, one for each finger to make a hand, and tape them together. What's next? Now we're gonna make little marks for the knuckles. Now we bend them at the knuckles. Make a little cut in the corner. Now we put the string through the straws and tie a knot at the top. Zoe, check this out. It's pretty basic, but it works. The strings are kind of like muscles that make a regular hand move. Thanks, guys. Bye, Bye Zoe. Zoe. That gives me an idea for... Challenges are Nora, hi, and Dina. <laughs> How do you like your new homemade prosthetics? They're cool, not fashionable. <laughs> Today's challenge is like getting ready for school, except while using your prosthetics. You have to pour some water, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and take a bite. And put your notebook and pen in your bag. Sound easy? No. Simple. There's more. What? You have to put your jacket on, and then come to this table and write your name in your notebook. Oh, and it's a race. First person to finish wins. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, go! First step, spread peanut butter and jelly to make the sandwiches. Looks like you're having a little bit of trouble there. <laughs> it's not easy holding a spoon with homemade prosthetics, is it? There we go. They each have to take one bite of their sandwich and have one sip of water. This is gonna be tasty. Dina's ready to bite into her sandwich. Done. <laughs> I guess she doesn't like peanut butter. Nora's having a hard time getting the peanut butter out of that jar. But Dina's struggling with her glass. There's the peanut butter. Beautiful. And there's the jelly. Dina's got her straw, but Nora's got her sandwich made. Dina takes her sip, and Nora's catching up. Ready for school. Now they've got to pack their bags and put their jackets on. Ugh. Keep going, guys. Ugh. Oh, show my jacket. After a slow start, <laughs> Nora's caught up. Ugh. They're so close. <laughs> but Nora's having trouble getting her coat off the rack. Dina's got her arm in. She's getting ahead again, but Nora's not far behind. Yes. Uh-oh, Dina can't get her second arm in. Uh. Oh, no. Nora's got her jacket on. <laughs> Dina's having a little bit of trouble over there. Oh my goodness, my sleeve. Keep going, Dina. Shoot. Yes. Way to go, Dina. Now get out your notebook and write your name. <laughs> Nora's getting ahead. <laughs> Dina, I like the technique. <laughs> oh no. Shoot. Whoops, pick up that notebook, Dina. <laughs> and. Done. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Nora wins. <laughs> okay, how do you put on a jacket? <laughs> so
So what was the hardest part? Um, probably putting the jacket on and spreading the peanut butter on the toast. Same with the jacket situation, but writing your name, seriously. <laughs> well, our prosthetics were homemade, but I got this question from Amber. What are prosthetics made of? A flat earth corner! Crocodile eat your hand? Need new hand? Look no further than Blacksmith Bob's Best. The only shop with the best materials, the best tools, and the best replacement limbs in town. We forge each and every one in heavy, extra strong metal. Behold this iron hand. It does not bend, it does not flex, so it will never break. That's the beauty of iron. Get them while they're hot. Oh, it's fresh out of the forge! It's so hot! Ah! <laughs> There was a time when prosthetics looked like pirate hooks, and they were made of metal that didn't even bend. I think it's really different today. To help me find out how prosthetics are made, I brought two special guests to come to my aid. Please welcome to my show, Nicholas Marchand and Carolyn Vio. Hi, Zoe. Hi, Nicholas and Carolyn. We brought some prosthetics for you today, Zoe. <laughs> And I'm wearing mine. <laughs> I won't squeeze you too hard. You can squeeze harder? Mm-hmm, I can. That's a very firm handshake you got there. <laughs> sure is. These all look super cool, but Amber wants to know what these are made of. All the new prostheses are made out of a black material called carbon fiber, the same material that we make race cars and jets out of. This one looks a little bit old-fashioned. It's not the same as all the other ones. This is my first prosthesis. I had it 40 years ago. You want to see how it works? This was a bit harder to use than nowadays prosthetic. So by pulling my shoulders forward, it pulls on the cable here and makes it open. <laughs> it kind of looks like a pirate hook. <laughs> You're right, Zoe. But it seems like it must have been pretty hard to use. And not that useful. So I chose not to wear a prosthesis for quite a while. And then I got into sports and even though I could do anything with just one hand, I got some prosthetic made for sport, like this one. I used it to ski. It even got me to the Paralympics, where I got a gold medal. Wow. And I have other adapters. See, I just switch, and there I can go and play golf. Wow. I have another one for cross-country skiing, where the pole goes here, and allows me to cross-country ski. This is for swimming. <laughs> oh yeah, it kind of looks like a, a paddle. That's really cool. Yeah, but today, prosthetic can do much more. Like this one? Yes, yeah, Zoe, that's what we call a myoelectric hand. Myo means muscle, and electric means it's powered by electricity. Your muscles on your arm generate a signal that in turn power the fingers of that hand. What muscles make it move? Let me show you. Just flexing the muscles in my arm. See how you close those wow. fingers? Now close them fast. You're making wow. those fingers work. That's really cool. But my hand is more than open and close. That brings us to this hand. It's called the Quantum. It is the most advanced hand in the world for myoelectrics. And this hand actually allows you to choose from 35 different grips. If I wanted to hold the plate, I would activate the plate grip, whereby I can take the plate, put it right under the thumb, close down on the plate, hold it, and then bring it wherever I want. That's really cool. Do you want to use a keyboard? You can use your finger to press a keyboard. So depending on what you want to do, you can make the hand choose that grip for you. That's super cool. Here's a question I got from Olivia. How come running blades don't look like real legs? Yeah, how come they don't look like real legs? Well, that's a good question. So most running legs work like a spring. This is a running leg that belongs to a boy. When that boy runs, he puts weight on the leg, it bends, and then bounces forward, pushing him forward. So do blades like this give someone extra running power? They don't give you extra running power. They only give you the power that you put in. Well, that was awesome. Thanks for helping me find stuff out about prosthetics. You're welcome, Zoe. You're welcome. Check this out. 
found out that there's some really amazing technology out there for prosthetics. This artificial hand can actually feel things like a real hand. But this question from Antoine really made me think. How do you survive without arms? To get an idea of how hard it is to do simple things while missing an arm. Try this. Try tying your shoe with one hand. <laughs> it's really not <laughs> easy. <laughs> okay, it's tight. Now I just have to make a bow. <laughs> Almost got it. Oh, got it. Oh, finally. Surviving with no arms must be really tough. Prosthetics are super helpful, but I found out they can cost a lot of money and people can't always afford them, especially in really poor countries. But I found out that today we can use 3D printers to make them. A 3D printer heats up stuff like plastic to build an object like the artificial hands these kids are wearing, made specially to fit their size. And because they're a lot less expensive than other prosthetics, it means that when kids grow, it's easier to have bigger ones made for them. These 3D limbs are changing lives for kids around the world who might have lost limbs because of war. Now, they can do lots of the same things other kids do. Hey, those prosthetics are really fun looking. Maybe I'd make myself an extra arm. Mmm, sweet. I wonder what my friends would want. A friend. If you could add an extra part to your body, what would it be? Wings, so I could fly. It would be a robotic arm that could, like, it could activate anything. Like, if you want a, a pencil, it could just activate a pencil. An arm that the hand, it shoots spider webs like Spider-Man. Legs, so we can run really fast and always win a race. <laughs> Feet that could fly, so with jetpacks on the bottom. Gills so I could swim around and stay underwater for as long as I wanted. <laughs> now here's a question from William. Can animals have prosthetics? Hey! Bionic. There's only one place to find out. At an animal hospital. Hi, Jean. Hi, Zoe. So, can animals have prosthetics? Sure, like humans. I designed some myself. Cool. Can I see one? So, this is Gypsy. Hi, Gypsy. Do you have superpowers? Yes, you do. You're super cute. What happened to her leg? Well, she's born with one leg shorter than the other one. So, we made a prosthetic. I like how it's pink. <laughs> how long has she had it? Almost one year. All right, now I'm gonna take off the prosthetic device, okay? Just to check the leg. There we go. I'll take off the socks. Is it a bit better now? Right now, yes, because her leg was weak because she wasn't using it. Now that she is using it, it's much stronger. You have more muscle here. That's great. Are there any other animals with prosthetics? Absolutely. It turns out that lots of different animals can get prosthetics if they need them. This duck lost her feet, and Rajon made prosthetic feet for her. He also helped out a bunny rabbit. This is Daisy, and she got sick. And the back leg doesn't work anymore, so I designed kind of a wheelchair. That's so cool. She's so cute. Now she can walk without dragging her back leg. That was causing her a lot of problems. That's amazing, Rajon. Hi, Maria. Hi, Zoe. You do physical therapy with animals? I sure do. It helps them to adjust to their new prosthetics. We're gonna start with a little massage. It's gonna help to relax Gypsy's muscles. You're gonna make circular motions with your thumb all the way along her spinal muscles because they get tired from carrying her prosthetic. Go ahead. Do I do it this way? Sure. What's important is to not get on the bones, but to stay on the muscles. Gypsy seems to really be enjoying that. <laughs> This looks like an exercise ball I've seen before, but never shaped like this. It looks like a peanut. It's shaped this way to be able to support a dog's body. 
All these exercises help strengthen Gypsy's back. Gypsy has a lot of pressure on her back by carrying this heavy prosthetic. So we need to make sure it stays good and strong for a long time. She'll be stronger than ever after this. Thanks for helping me find out about animal prosthetics. You're, You're welcome. welcome. And thank you, Gypsy. And here's a question I got from Rowan. Could a person who's paralyzed walk with a prosthetic device? I checked, and it's possible. There's a special suit called an exoskeleton that helps people who are paralyzed or have difficulty walking. It's kind of like a robot that you wear. Moving your weight a bit to one side makes the robotic leg on the other side take a step. There's another exosuit that anyone can wear. It helps people in construction or other physical jobs. With the exosuit, they can lift heavy things without tiring out their muscles as much or getting hurt. That seems almost like science fiction. <gasps> Maybe I could have an exosuit that could let me time travel. Wow, nice T-Rex. Yeah, sure you can fly, but can you do this? <laughs> All this high tech stuff has me wondering the same thing as Megan. Can you control a prosthetic with your mind? I found out you can! Scientists have been testing this amazing technology that lets a person with missing limbs move an artificial arm the way we use regular arms. By mind control! They're still working on it, but it's super cool! And guess what I've used mind control to do? Get the answer to Jada's question that started off today's show! Do prosthetics make you bionic? Well, Jada, the big answer is... Yes, they do! I found out that bionic means using machines to help us do things, sometimes as a replacement body part. Prosthetics are like small machines that help people walk, ski like a champ, or throw a ball. So prosthetics make us bionic but they don't give us any superpowers. Huh? They don't? Well, at least not yet. But maybe in the future. I am future Zoe. I'm not far from today. The things I can do will blow your mind away. Everything you're dreaming need is coming true. Swim like a fish. A super hearing, too. X-ray vision. Bionic eyes. French fries. Half human, half machine, a cyborg you could be. And fly so high that from the sky the whole world you would see. I am future Zoe. I'm not far from today. But I still have to clean my room and put my toys away? Come on, future me. Let's get this done. In the meantime, I have Roland to help me out. for more Finding Stuff Out. Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out. My mom's making me clean while I do the show today because something up here stinks really bad. It isn't you, is it? <coughs> nope. At first, I thought it was this banana that I found under my sofa. And then I thought it might have been this tuna and onion sandwich that I found in my backpack. But it's not, it's something else something worse. Fortunately, you sent me a lot of questions about garbage this week, and I'm hoping that the answers will help me find the source of this mystery smell. The first question is from Alicia. What happens to stuff that goes in the trash? The short answer is, it will start to stink. But seriously, I don't know. But by the end of the show, I'll find out the answer to that and all your other questions about garbage. Here's a question from Quasi. Why does garbage stink? Ugh. Right now, I'd be happy just to know where this stink is coming from. But let's take a look at the garbage with my Super Zoom-O-Matic. Keep watching. See those tiny creatures crawling around? I call them garbage-eating monsters. But I found out they're really called fungi and bacteria. They break down food garbage and eat it. When they munch on the trash, they create lots of stinky garbage. 
It's sort of like the way your stomach makes stinky gases when you digest food. Hey, I smell a song coming on. Break it down when garbage breaks down, the gases go up as fungi and bacteria go chomp, chomp, chomp. When garbage breaks down, the trash can go. <laughs> If it's old and there's mold, hold your nose, there it goes. When that breakdown starts, it's like the trash can burps and farts. Excuse me. Stinky gases aren't all bad, though. Scientists have found a way to take natural gases from rotting trash and create energy. We're not at the point yet where we can all heat our houses with rotting bananas. So in the meantime, here's a good thing to do with old food scraps. This is where my family keeps some of our slimiest garbage. Like last week's leftover salad. Imagine how I felt when my mom said she was making my snack with this stuff. Ugh. Let me show you what happened. Harrison, I made a snack for you. Harrison, where are you? I have a really good snack for you, Harrison. Where'd that boy go? Harrison, a good snack. Yummy, yummy. Harrison. Turns out the snack was just some berries from our garden. This is a special kind of garbage called compost, made from food scraps. When it rots, you spread it on your garden. It's like super food for plants. To find out how garbage turns into compost, please welcome my special guest, naturalist Julie Hamill. Hey, Harrison. Hey. What's that smell? Oh, sorry, it's a mystery. Oh, worm? No offense, but aren't we supposed to keep bugs out of the kitchen? Well, actually, I'm here today to show you that we can keep it in the kitchen. So there's worms inside, and you actually take fruit scraps and you put it inside. So we can put these in? Yeah. So we just get it down in Mix it there. up, right? So it helps the worms to eat them all. So how many worms are in here? There's about 100. That's a lot. Yeah, they actually multiply. You put a couple of them, and they will multiply in weeks, and you'll have more than that. They will create worm poop. And there's inside, there's poop mixed with the soil. Worm poop? That's disgusting. Well, it's not that bad, because it's full of nutrients, right? So you get earth mixed with a lot, a lot of nutrients, which is really good for your plants. So does that mean it's good to let bugs go inside of your garbage? Well, actually, worms are good, but you don't want cockroaches or fruit flies to come in. As like you can these? see there, yeah, there's fruit flies. Oh yeah, there's little fruit flies all over the fruit. And why, why are they so bad? Because what they do, they lay their eggs in fruit and then it will be rotten and will smell a lot. So we really, really don't want that in your compost. That's not very good. Well, thanks for helping us find stuff out. You want to start your own compost? Yeah. Here you go. Ew, I'm, I'm holding worm poop. Perfectly natural. <laughs> well, at least I'll be able to start a composter now. Thanks. <laughs> What would happen if we didn't recycle? I checked, and not all trash gets eaten by fungi or bugs. Things like plastic take a really, really long time to decompose, so toys you throw away now could still be in the dump when you're really old. At least I still have my tea. Some things like styrofoam and kitchen appliances might never dissolve on their own. If we didn't recycle, all that stuff would just pile up. I found out that if you add up all the garbage humans throw away every year, it's enough to fill garbage trucks stretching from here to the moon. Yeah. Enough garbage to reach to the moon? That's more than 38,000 kilometers of trash in one year. How many candy wrappers is that? Uh-oh, will we have enough trash one day that will reach all the way to Mars? That is so much garbage! What can we do with it? Where will it all go? You're gonna make my head explode. We make so much garbage, it's hard to find a place to put it all. Sometimes the dump gets so full that we have to send our trash away. But eventually, the places we send it to will fill up also. Some people try to solve the problem by burning garbage. But that can make a lot of smelly air pollution. Others dump trash into rivers, streams, and oceans. In the Pacific Ocean, there's actually a garbage patch bigger than Switzerland, bigger than Japan. It's about the size of Texas. That's because the ocean currents carry garbage to places where it builds up. 
Even your ordinary household garbage can be dangerous to animals that live in the water. So the answer to your question is that if we didn't recycle, eventually we'd have mounds of garbage everywhere. Fortunately, humankind has a plan. I found out you're supposed to do three things. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. Reduce just means to use less stuff, which makes less garbage. So to get some ideas on how to do that, let's get some... Hi, I'm here to talk to some kids about trash. So how many bags of trash do you think the average person makes in a year? 20, 19, 62, 14, 70. So on average, kids like you weigh about four trash bags. Now here's the answer. A typical person goes through 100 trash bags per year. That's like 25 kids. That's like the whole class. And now I'm a piece of garbage. <laughs> So how can we make less garbage? Using it again. Recycling. Reusing. Composting. If you use paper, don't waste it that quickly. Eat less canned food, because there'll be less cans thrown out. Get a robot to eat it. Yum, yum. Around the world, people reuse things in ingenious ways. In the Caribbean, musicians make instruments out of old steel drums. In Africa, some kids make cool race cars out of scrap wire. And anywhere in the world, an old tire can make a great swing. Sorry, but I thought the stink was coming from the recycling bin. But it's not. Recycling is for non-stinky things, like glass, metal, or plastic. Sabriel had a question about that. How does stuff get recycled? A recycling center is like a super destructo machine. Glass gets crushed so it can be cleaned and melted into new glass. And so does metal. That means it won't end up in the trash heap. Paper gets turned into gooey pulp so it can be made into new paper. That means fewer trees need to be cut down. Recycling can save entire forest worth of trees. But what happens when you have an old TV or computer that you need to throw away? It has plastic and glass and metal. So where does it go? Well, it's where I'm going right now. I'm here at Sims Recycling Solutions, where they take old TVs, monitors, and video games to come get recycled. And Cindy Coots knows all about how to do that. Welcome to Sims Recycling Solutions. Thanks. So how much stuff does get recycled here? We actually recycle 60 million pounds of old electronics from across Canada and the US at this site. 60 million pounds a year? That's more than the weight of two and a half elephants every hour. I'm going to introduce you to Kurt, who is our expert hey, dismantler. Kurt. Nice to meet you. That cord contains copper that we're going to recycle. There you go, that's the plastic housing. There we go. Now Kurt is gonna take all the connections of okay. the electronics off. Now he's taking off something called the yoke. And you're gonna see that that yoke has a lot of copper in it. Okay. Recycled copper is really useful, but if you just throw it out, that's bad. Just like the lead in my picture tube that is highly toxic to humans. Most people throw their monitors into the trash, ends up in a landfill, right. it rains, the rain picks up some lead, yeah. and that's not good for the environment or not the people. Good. <laughs> I guess I won't be able to find stuff out on that monitor anymore. Well, the beauty of recycling is that all those resources are going to be recycled to make a new monitor. For me? For you or anyone else. Awesome! Plastic, metal, or glass. Each material of my monitor has to be recycled separately. So you can imagine if we're processing 60 million pounds of monitors and TVs, mm -hmm. we'd need a lot of people. Right. So we actually have equipment that can take this apart, 20,000 pounds an hour. That's 400 TVs or monitor every hour. That is a lot. It is a lot. <laughs> Thanks for being on my show. You're very welcome. And remember, don't ever throw out your old electronics. Make sure you recycle them. I'll make sure to recycle. <laughs> Uh-oh, do try this at home. Once you've cleaned everything that you're gonna recycle, 
you can crush it and make it really flat so that you can fit more into the container. With aluminum cans, there's a special trick. Crush it from top to bottom, but make sure not to cut yourself on any sharp edges. Presto, you've just made a can cake, a robot's favorite treat. Yum, yum. I've got to find that stink. Oh, well. The show must go on. Why do you have to throw garbage in the garbage? The Flat Earth Corner! Garbage can? What is that? We throw trash on ground or in cave. Wherever. Oh, meat was good. Here in the Middle Ages, we are proper and civilized. We put our trash in the buckets and then throw it out the window. Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. Hey! This is a perfectly good banana. Today, we make so much trash that we need transportation systems to get rid of it all so it can go to recycling centers and dumps. People who lived a long time ago didn't have as much stuff, so they didn't make much trash. They could leave junk lying around and their mums didn't complain at all. Archaeologists are scientists who study what life was like a long time ago. When ancient people threw their trash on the ground, the food stuff decomposed but things like broken pots and tools didn't. They got buried in the dirt. So some of what you see in archeology span museums was actually stuff someone threw away. Hey, I found my pot. To find out more, it's time for... My Great Challenge. Okay, today our great challengers are Darcy. What's up? Jake. Whoop, whoop. Caitlin. Whoop. And Kiana. Yeah. Awesome, so you two will be team plastic, and you two are gonna be team paper. It stinks in here. Agreed. It does. Yeah. Good thing I brought yeah. this. Woo! So, you guys are gonna be like archaeologists and be doing some work that real archaeologists do. Does that sound cool? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because today, you get to go through garbage. But don't worry, it's old garbage, and it is from a regular household, and we've taken out all the sharply edged things and all the germy things, so don't worry about that, okay? Okay, because I'm not really pleasant with the garbage. With the garbage, okay. So, your challenge is to figure out, just from looking at the garbage, who lives in the household? It's the science of garbology. Team paper, you guys will be first. Team plastic, you guys can uh, go downstairs and, and see my mom and uh, have some cookies or something. Peace out! <laughs> go! <laughs> Whoa! This family sure needs to learn to recycle. What do you think this is for? A dog. <laughs> what the? Rabbit. Rabbit. Oh, wait, what? Hamster, I don't know. Yeah, yeah hamster. Um, person. Person. <laughs> this belongs to, like, to a woman and a kid. Baby. A hamster, uh, a baby, a toddler. <laughs> toddler. Three, two, one. Okay, time's up. Who do you think this garbage belongs to? I uh, think that it belongs to a little boy. A little boy? That's four and years old. Four years this, old. It's a dog. So they have a dog. And I think this is like their hamster, I think. They have like a hamster. hamster wheel. Yeah. A baby boy also. They have a baby boy as well as the four-year-old? Yeah. Okay. And they have a girl. And they have a mom. And a dad. And a dad. Now let's see how Team Plastic does. OK, so Team Plastic, are you ready? Yes. You have two minutes starting now. I am garbage! No! The teams both have the same stuff in their garbage bags. Yeah. It's pretty disgusting. Just help me to do that much. <laughs> um, OK, I see some stuff. Weird stuff. They own a dog. Hey, an old G.I. Joe thing, I think. It's a G.I. Joe thing. Fruit ring. Hmm, those taste good. A dog bone. Mm. Baby. 
corn chips. Okay. Baby. Baby. Hamster. Yes, <laughs> hamster. Makeup, all right. We don't need makeup, Darcy. Food, 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 food. Three, two, one. Pizza! Okay, stop. Huh? <laughs> Who do you think? Eat. Who do you think this garbage belongs to? Um, a family that likes to eat and they're overweighted because of all of the junk. Okay, so who do you think the members of the family are? A dog, a hamster, a female woman, a, female a woman, baby, a baby, uh, and a kid, a, and a boy, and a boy, and a dad, and a dad. Okay. Well, mom likes to dress up a lot. <laughs> mom likes to dress up a lot. Okay, so now I am going to announce the winner. Are you ready? Yes. yes. Okay, the winner is. Team Plastic! Yes! yes. <laughs> yeah! Congratulations! <laughs> you got the boy right, the baby boy, you had the dog and the hamster, the mom and the dad, and you had their eating habits, like they eat too much junk food, you had that down. And Team Paper said that they had a little girl on top of all those things that you said, and they didn't get the eating habits, so that's why you guys won. <laughs> Team Plastic rule! Thanks for playing my great challenge. You're very welcome! Now for a trashy question from Anthony. Where does this toilet water go? Well, Anthony, after you flush, it goes on a long trip and comes out in places like this, so you can swim in it. Gross! But not really. That's just the end of the story. Back to the beginning. I found out that dirty toilet water flows into pipes in your house that lead to giant underground pipes called sewers. The sewers lead to water treatment plants like this one. They remove the poopy sludge, pump oxygen through the leftover water, and use chemicals to get rid of bad bacteria and viruses, and send the now fresh water back into the environment where it came from. And speaking of toilet water, astronauts drink their own pee. It's true. When a rocket goes to space, it has to take all the astronauts drinking water with it because there aren't any stores in space. Can I have a slushy? No, we're not turning back just for that. But when astronauts drink, eventually they have to pee. I told you to go before we left the space station. But most of our pee actually is water. So if astronauts clean it up and turn it back into drinking water, they won't have to pack as much water on the trip. Here's how it works. The astronauts put the pee through a special filter that takes out all the bad stuff. It's like a mini version of the water treatment plant. Mm. Once it's clean to drink, they add a flavored powder. I guess that's to take their minds off the fact that they're drinking a liquid that used to be pee. Well, the taste is great as uh, Gennady's showing you it's perfectly clear and uh, worth chasing in uh, zero G here. Mmm, lemon. I wonder if this goes in the garbage or the recycling. Speaking of which, did we ever answer Alicia's question? What happens to stuff that goes in the trash? The big answer is... We make a lot of garbage and it all has to go somewhere. Some of it goes into landfills, recycling centers, or treatment plants. It takes a big team effort to get rid of all of our waste. Kids can do our part by reducing how much stuff we use, reusing stuff instead of throwing it out, and by recycling. Oh, and you'll be glad to know I finally found where that awful smell was coming from. My socks! I thought I'd save water by not washing them, but I think I better put them in the laundry. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. Can I have a slushy now? I said no! Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out, the show where I answer your questions. Today's episode is all about being sick, because, well, I'm sick. The bad news is, I can't go to school. But the good news is, I have time to look stuff up for you. Here on the show that knows all. How come your nose gets runny? Why does your nose run? So it can get away from the smell. But seriously, the short answer is 
I don't know. That's why it's called the short answer. But by the end of the show, I'll have your answer. Here's another question. Why do we get sick sometimes? The Flat Earth Corner! Why do you get sick? Well, you've come to the right place. Welcome to medieval Europe. We've got all the filth, disease, and plague you've ever wanted. So where do you go when you get sick? That's right, me, your friendly neighborhood, Barber. As any good barber will tell you, you get sick because of evil spirits. And the best way to get rid of evil spirits? Drain your blood, of course. Hey, come back. I thought I heard you sniffle. I can bleed that cold right out of you. Trust me, I'm your barber. Forget evil spirits. Nowadays, we know that germs make us sick. Now, here's the next question from Logan. What do germs look like? Sorry to be rude, it's just that I've got a lot of germs for you to look at. Here, I'll just use my handy Super Zoomomatic. I can't make any sense of that, but I know someone who can. Please welcome my special guest, germ expert, Caitlin Soy. Hi. Hi, Harrison. How are you? Good. I brought you something today. Uh, I'm a little old for stuffed toys, I think. This isn't a stuffed toy. This is one of the deadliest viruses we know, Ebola virus. I think I'm a little young to die also. So these are stuffed toys of germs. So do germs such as like the chicken pox, do they actually have like a red thing and like two really big eyes and stuff? No, they don't. These are just toys. But different viruses and different bacteria, they do look different from each other. They don't just actually look like this. This is what viruses and bacteria really look like. Chicken pox is often a disease that we get in childhood. Yeah. I don't know if you had it. I remember having chicken pox and I had the rash all over my body with those itchy, itchy spots. Uh, not, not very fun. fun. <laughs> and what's this purple one? This one, his name is the kissing disease and it causes the disease called mono. Mm -hmm. And the virus is called Epstein-Barr virus. Ooh. Has a nice long name. It does have a nice <laughs> long name. Most of these viruses do. This stuffed animal represents rhinovirus. It can cause the common cold. This one represents measles virus, and often infects children. What's the difference between a virus and a bacteria? Well, viruses and bacteria are two different things. They can both make you sick. Viruses are special in that they can't live on their own. They require a host, someone like you, to allow them to live. Whereas bacteria, they're bigger and they can live on their own and they can grow on their own and they don't require someone or something to live in. That's a lot of ways to get sick. I'm surprised at how different they are. Well, there are bacteria and viruses almost everywhere, even in that glass of water. Maybe 50 million bacteria could be in that water. 50 million? Am I gonna die? No, you're not gonna die. Don't worry. Most bacteria don't make you get sick. They're there to help you. And so there's many bacteria within your stomach and they help you digest your food. They help fight off bad bacteria and bad viruses that mm -hmm. come into your body. And they help keep you healthy and keep you happy. So how do viruses make you sick? Well, viruses come into your body and they need to find a place to live. But your body doesn't like that and it wants to get it out because yeah. it's starting to make you sick. So your body's immune system rushes to the point. And often this results in a fever. That's what makes you hot and sweaty yeah. when you're sick with a virus. And that's your body's way of fighting the virus and to try and get it out of your body so then you can get better. So would you say viruses or bacteria, like is there one that's worse for you or? Nope, they both can make you very sick and they can both um, not make you sick. It depends on the specific bacteria or the specific virus. So how can we prevent getting sick? One of the most important things to do is to wash your hands. Wash. Um, other things that are, are really good is to cover your nose when you sneeze. Yeah. And one big thing that you can do, and you probably did it when you were a kid, was to get a vaccine. Yeah. Do you know what a vaccine is? It's a needle, right? Yeah. But what a vaccine does is it comes into your body and it teaches your body how to respond to a virus infection. Yeah. So sometimes the vaccine can come in and it pretends to be the whole virus or part of the virus so your body can practice. Kind of like when you practice to go out on the hockey rink. You go to your practices, you practice the games, then you go yeah. and play the game. So when you've been vaccinated, your body's had that chance to practice. So when the big game comes or the challenge and you get infected with the virus, your body is ready and it knows what's, what to do to prevent the infection. Well, cool. Thank you, Caitlin, for being on my show. Thanks for having me. Now here's a question from Adam. 
How does a germ make you sick? Just thinking about germs made me a little ill. But to answer your question, Adam, let's get animated. Okay, here we've got a drawing of an extremely handsome human being. Why, thank you. Now, if a germ got inside this person... Hey, wait! What are you... This looks like a good place for an invasion. I don't feel so good. <laughs> this is my host now. The reason you don't feel good is because there's a fight going on inside of your body. It's you versus germs. Sometimes a fever is your body's secret weapon. Nothing can stop me. <laughs> What's that smell? Uh oh. How do germs get in people's body? Well, Maria, the same way this washed and very healthy apple does. Through our mouths. But unfortunately, unlike this apple, germs won't keep the doctor away. Basically, germs can enter through any hole in your body, like a cut that you didn't wash properly. Hey, holes in your body, that would make a fantastic song! You've got holes in your head, that's where a germ goes. It can enter your body through the holes in your nose or the holes in your head. We all have holes in our head where germs can get in and make us sick. Sick. Germs? Sick! Also, would it give you a shock to know that germs can get in where you talk? Germs get in! Germs get in! Germs get in! Germs! They can enter your body through the holes in your nose. Gross. Disgusting. Nobody likes germs. I use my hands for a much better task. I use them to call up the questions you ask. Can you get sick by not washing your hands? Let's find out! It's time to get some Street Smarts! I'm here at a school pulling a little prank while the kids are at recess for the interest of science. Now, I'm covering stuff that kids touch every day at school with special germ powder. Don't worry, I'm not putting real germs on anything. The powder just represents the germs and shows how they get onto your body. You can't see the powder though without a black light. See what I mean? It really works. Now I'll come back after recess and see how much of the powder gets on the kids' hands. Hi, everybody. Hi. Would it surprise you to know that I covered everything that you've touched earlier today in special germ powder? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, but luckily it's not actually germ powder or else you'd have germs all over you by now. <laughs> so just give me one second and I'll be right back. Okay, so come stand in front of this special black light. It'll show any germ powder that you have on yourself. Okay, I'm gonna turn the lights off now. Cool. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Where? I have a lot. Yeah. I have a lot. I have a lot. So as you see, you have a lot of germ powder all over you, but some of you have it on your faces because, well, you touched the germ like powder you. and then rubbed it on your faces. Yeah, like me. That's why you need to wash your hands. Which brings me to... My Great Challenge! So now we're gonna cover your hands in more germs, which is actually just some special goopy stuff that will glow in the black light. Everyone has their hands covered, right? Yeah! Now here's the challenge. You're gonna go wash your hands and the one with the cleanest hands wins. On your mark, it's go! You all have 30 seconds to wash your hands. So, clean up well. The best way to wash your hands is to wet them under warm water. Then, away from the water, add soap and rub them together to work the soap into a lather. Rub the soap into the front and back of your hands, including your fingers and under your nails, for at least 15 seconds. Then, rinse your hands and pat them dry with a paper towel, and voila! You got clean, germ-free hands. Okay, stop! So under this ultraviolet light, I'm gonna be able to see how well you cleaned your hands. So, so I'm gonna be grading on a scale of one to 10, 10 being very clean and one being extremely germy. A four 
Oh, that's pretty good. I'd say seven. Eight. <laughs> uh, a four. <laughs> four also. <laughs> so I'd say a nine. <laughs> Minus one. <laughs> Five. Oh, geez. Uh, two. So it looks like we have a winner, and it's Caleb! <laughs>《Full of Germans again. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, back. You want to know something weird? We wash off germs, right? But if you get used to being around some germs, your body builds up defenses against them. I read that having a messy room is actually good for your immune system. Unfortunately, my mom still makes me clean my room. Now here's a question from Liam. Can you live in a germ-free environment? According to my mom, I'm not capable of that at all. But for the real scientific answer, let's go to my roving reporter and good friend, Sydney. Thanks, Harrison. This is the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg. They know lots about germs here. In fact, they study the world's deadliest. The security is so tight here, we aren't even allowed to show you the entrance to the building. But this is what's in here. These are some of the most dangerous germs in the world. They may be small, but they're nasty. Today I'm here with microbiologist Dr. Gary Covinger, the head of special pathogens here in the lab. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're most welcome. Why is it so tough to get into this building? Well, you know this is a world-class facility and what is being done here basically is a detection of diseases caused by very dangerous germs for some of them. And so we need to keep them under control and we need to keep them safe, make sure that they don't go all over the place. Is it possible to live in a germ-free environment? I think it is for you know a short, short period of time. We have an environment that is very, very controlled in a suit. The scientists who work with those germs wear suits that are germ-free on the inside. So, to answer Liam's question, they live in a germ-free environment when they're inside the suits. That's because they don't want the normal germs we carry to mix with the germs they are learning about. And the suits also protect the scientists because the dangerous germs can't get in. Would you like to try one? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, awesome, let's go. <gasps> Whoa, is that it? Yeah, so that's the suit. Uh, I'm cool. gonna help you put it on so you okay. can remove your lab coat and your shoes. Almost in. These containment suits completely seal the scientists off, just like an astronaut spacesuit. Okay. Oh yeah, I can feel air going through my arms and my feet. Yeah. They even have their own air supply to make sure the researcher doesn't breathe in any deadly germs. This is so cool. I feel like, like an astronaut on a space station. We have landed on the moon. <laughs> Does this mean that I'm totally protected from dangerous viruses? Completely. Cool. And here I am, living in a germ-free environment. But then... I'm getting hungry, though. Is there anything you have to eat, please? Do you want to try a sandwich? Yes, thank you. Yummy, 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 yummy. yummy. I want to see that. What, what? There's no I don't think this is going to work out. What? That's huge? That's not nice. Thank you. <laughs> so like Dr. Carpenter said, it's great to be living in a germ-free environment, but not for long, especially when you're hungry. <laughs> Thanks, Sydney. Even though you could live germ-free, you wouldn't want to. Fortunately, our bodies know the difference between germs and sandwiches, and they keep the germs out and the sandwiches in. Mm -hmm. This one's got my name on it. Why do you have to get the shots? When you get a shot, you're getting a vaccine. A vaccine is a virus, but it's a dead or very weak virus that won't make you sick. Doctors give you a vaccine so that- Your body learns to recognize a virus. Here's how it happens. Say the dead or weak virus they put in you with a needle is this green clay. 
Your body has stuff that smushes into it and wraps itself around the virus like a shield. And that shield protects your body from the virus. Now, if a real living virus ever got in, your body would recognize it and would know how to make the shield needed to protect you. Before the virus could make you sick. Okay, so I have to get a flu shot every year. So why doesn't one vaccine protect me? It turns out every time you get the flu, the virus has changed itself. So even though you've had the flu before, your body might not recognize it. Germs may not look all that bright, but they can be pretty sneaky. <laughs> that reminds me of a question I got from Aliyah. Can germs think like us? Are they trying to find new ways to make us sick? I don't really know the answer to that, so I'll throw the question over to Sydney at the microbiology lab. So, do germs think, and do they think about new ways to get to us? Well, you know, germs don't really think, but what they do is they evolve very, very quickly. By that, it means that they change all the time. So, when they change, then they can change in a form that they can make us sick. How do you figure out what the germs are doing? What we do is that we look at them at different time points, and so we see how do they change. If we uh, could take the example of influenza, so influenza changes all the time, and every year we look at the new influenza, and once we know which one it is, we can develop a vaccine that is a perfect fit for that virus. If you're, for example, you're vaccinated and you have this shield around you, then the, the germ is not gonna be able to attack you and grow because that's what germ wants to do. They want to grow and proliferate all the time. Wow, that was some lab. Good thing those guys are on the job. And in case you're wondering, it's just as tough to get out as it was to get in. Thanks, Sydney. Your enthusiasm is contagious, which means I can't wait to take another question. Here's one from Destiny. Can we see germs? You mean without a microscope? Sure. Even if you don't have your own super zoom you can grow your own germs called fungus. Like this gunk between my toes. If I put it into this special scientific gel, all the germy things will grow. It takes a while to grow, so I made one last week. What? Smells like gym socks. Although lots of germs are invisible, you can see and smell some of them right in front of you. How come food has best before dates and you get sick? Congratulations! Your question is today's... Uh-oh. Do try this at home. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you get sick. I looked up the answer, and it turns out fungus and bacteria don't just grow in scientific gel. They'll also grow in food, if they have enough time. So food companies put a best before date on it. It means eat it before this date, or afterwards you might be eating germs! If you want to see how germs grow on food, next time you have a stale piece of bread, put it in a dark place, like a closet, for a week and watch all this moldy stuff grow on it. It's almost as gross as that toe fungus. Oh, and by the way, if you leave a sandwich under your bed, just tell your mom it's a science experiment. It usually works, at least the first time. How do we puke? If you want to know how I puke, it's usually in the toilet, whenever possible. But I think what you're asking is about what happens to make you throw up. So I checked the answer, and as gross as puking is, it's a good thing. It's your body's way of telling you that thing you just ate doesn't belong here. Like this piece of moldy bread. So there you go. Germs, fevers, vaccines, throwing up. I think I've covered all your questions, except for one. Remember? How come your nose gets runny? The big answer is... Okay, I looked up the answer, and it turns out our body produces icky, sticky mucus to keep germs out. How much mucus? About this much, every day. It's like a barrier against germs. I mean, would you want to go through that? And when some germs get in your body, where does that mucus go? It has to go somewhere, like out your nose. 
So blow your nose proudly, knowing that your body is making you healthier by fighting off those germs. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. It's been so noisy here. They're building a rec center down the street. And I can't concentrate. But once it's done, it's gonna be so cool. It's gonna have a big pool and a basketball court and a... They sure are using big, loud machines. It made me wonder the same thing Owen is wondering. How could they build those huge pyramids without using any machines? I don't know, Owen. It must have been really hard to build the pyramids without them. But by the end of the show, I'll find out how they did it. The Great Pyramids of Giza are humongous. If they didn't have big construction machines 4,000 years ago, they must have had something. Maybe finding out how we'd build pyramids today with big machines will help me find the answer. Hey, Zoe, you made it. Hey, Andy, I found out it took ancient Egyptians 20 years to build their biggest pyramids. How much faster do you think it could be done with the machines like the ones here? I'm not quite sure, Zoe, but it would take a lot less time and fewer people with machines like this. This is a backhoe. This is a great machine. Do you want to try it? Yeah! Great. Okay, Zoe, so this is the key to start it. Kay. Start the motor. This here is your steering wheel. There are lots of controls for Andy to show me in the backhoe. Okay, so forward and then reverse. This over here, if you pull back, lifts the bucket. They're not hard to understand, but mastering them is the another bucket. story. Just turn the key. Yeah. So now, to move, you want to raise the bucket a little bit because it's on the ground. A little bit more. Good. That's good. Now we want to go in forward. Okay. Okay, press on the brake pedal. There's a little bit of gas. Wow, I'm actually driving a backhoe. Okay. Okay, stop there. Use your brakes. Good. Now put your bucket down. Push down. Now drive ahead a little bit. I got to try to get under it. Okay, now start curling your bucket up off the gas. And scoop it up. Curl your bucket up. Now go forward a bit more. Careful. Now curl your bucket all the way up. Off the gas, off the gas. Good girl. Bring it up. Back her up. You did it. Picked up the rock. <laughs> this makes it a lot easier than doing it all by hand like the ancient Egyptians. It sure does. For example, this machine's arms are made up of levers that make it easy to lift something heavy. The digging bucket has teeth or wedges to help it cut into the earth. Hey, this machine doesn't have wheels like the backhoe. I got a question about that from Jana. Why do some machines have treads instead of wheels? Are these the treads? Yes, I call them tracks. How are they useful? Well, they're much wider and longer than wheels, so it helps you move better over uneven ground. So if this was sand in the desert, like where the pyramids are, the bulldozer would move easier than a machine on wheels? Yeah, the weight of the machine is spread over a larger area. So in sandy or muddy ground, it won't sink. They can push really heavy objects, too. All right, let's try it. Turn it on. Hi, Lifter, here I come. Bucket up a bit. Lifting the bucket. Good. There you go, good, keep going. Nothing can stop me. Good, keep going. Good job. That's how the dozer works. <laughs> Next question. What makes the arms on big machines move? To make these arms move, it requires a hydraulic pump. The engine pumps hydraulic oil through small parts called pistons. And that is what makes the arm and bucket move. The hydraulic system uses liquid, like water or oil, to make things move. Hmm. The ancient Egyptians didn't have those things. But they did have water. They could have used the water to help them build the pyramids. It's possible. Water can create a lot of pressure, which could be used as energy. So when you push on the plunger on this large syringe, you can see how the plunger on the small one moves up, even more than the amount you move the large plunger. That's what the pistons in the back would do, but they use oil instead of water. Cool. It's like when water shoots out of a syringe, but water is hard to squeeze. It moves through the wide end of the syringe and into the narrow end. The water has to go through a tiny opening so it moves faster and shoots out. That's basically how hydraulic pumps work in a backhoe. Uh-oh, do try this at home. 
You can try this with a spray bottle. Just make the hole big. See? It shoots out a soft spray. If you make the spray hole smaller, it shoots out harder and faster. Because you're forcing it through a small opening. When you press down hard on the trigger, it's like you're the motor in the backhoe. Giving the hydraulic pump all its power to move the machine's arms. A squirt toy is the same thing. The water is pushed through a small opening when you push the plunger. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the coolest machines here. It's called an excavator, and it's used to dig really deep into the ground and move big piles of earth. It can spin 360 degrees, and it gives me an idea for... Okay, Johnny and Sadie, are you ready to climb into this mighty machine and get to work? Yeah! Each of you have to move a pile of earth from one place to another. The earth you move has to be as high as you can make it. For each 10 centimeters, you get a point. Then, pick up a basketball with your excavator bucket, and that's an extra five points. The excavator spins all the way around, so if you get dizzy, don't throw up in there. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, ready? Let's do it. Johnny and Sadie each have three minutes. Get set, go. Go. Curl your bucket. Good. Stop right there. Good. Look at that bucket of earth. Good job. Wow. Swing over this way, nice and slow. Good, right there. And dump your bucket. There you go. Good job. That's a nice one. Nice, eh? Johnny's a natural. Good. Good job. Looks like Sadie's a natural, too. Oh, yeah. Good. Nice job. Good. Good job. Wow. Sadie sure is focused. Wow, good job. Oh, yeah, that's going to be a nice big pile. Good job. That one's going to be hard to beat. Both piles are identical. Challengers are neck and neck. 15 seconds left. Hurry up and get it over there. Dump your bucket. Quick, quick, quick. Nice and quick, all the way. Good job. Time's up. It was fun. I feel like I did a pretty good job. I think it would be fun if someone did this for a job. Johnny's pile is 121 centimeters for 12 points. Sadie's pile is 133 centimeters for 13 points. Sadie's ahead. Oh, yeah. Now for the basketball challenge. Challengers have to scoop up the basketball and dump it on their pile. First one to do it gets five points. Okay, let's go. Curl the bucket a bit. Boom up. Oh, oh Sadie almost had it. Boom up a bit. Oh. oh <laughs> that was close. We'll try again. Now stick in nice and fast. Maybe we'll get it. Curl. Oh, it's right on the edge. Oh, good try, good try. Too bad. Okay, scoop it up. Looking good for Johnny. Scoop quick. All right, good, you got the ball. He's got it. Okay, dump your bucket. Yeah! yeah! <laughs> He's a pro. So, to recap, Johnny got 12 points for his pile and five points for the basketball, and Sadie got 13 points for her pile. The winner is... Johnny! Yeah! Good job. Don't you just love the power of hydraulics? <laughs> no! Friend. Hey guys, what kind of big machine would you want to drive? Excavator, because I would be able to dig big holes. A uh, wrecking ball, because I like breaking stuff. A recycling truck, because I know I'm helping save the environment. I would like to drive a bulldozer because you could break down a building with a flick of a handle. I would like to control big cranes because I like heights. I like to drive a tow truck because my dad it, uh, works for a tow truck company and I want to help people. Monster truck because I do not need to wait in traffic. I'm allowed to like crush cars and keep on rolling. <laughs> and speaking of big machines, here's a question from Lex. What's the biggest machine in the world? I checked, and there are some gigantic machines out there. The world's biggest bulldozer weighs just over 152,000 kilograms. That's about the weight of 11 bulldozers, just like the one I drove. 
Then there's something called a crawler transporter that NASA uses to move spaceships. It weighs almost three million kilograms. That's more than 200 bulldozers. Wait, there's something bigger and heavier than three million kilograms? You're gonna make my head explode! Check this out. I found out the world's biggest land machine is an excavator they use for mining. It's 95 meters tall, 215 meters long, and weighs over 40 million kilograms. That's the weight of about 3,000 bulldozers. It must take a lot of energy to move it. Here's a question about that from Adriana. Instead of gas, why can't we use electricity for big machines? I found out that sometimes big machines do use electricity. We see lots of electric cars on the road today, but not many electric construction machines, but that's changing now. Using electricity to power construction machines makes less pollution. And now, there are some that use fuel and electricity. They're called hybrid machines. Some are now totally electric. In the future, we'll probably have more and more electric construction machines. Speaking of which, my friends made their own electric motor. The experiment! Hi, Lex and Logan. Hi, Hi Zoe. Zoe. So what stuff do you need to build your motor? Well, we need a battery, a magnet, and some copper wire. We also need a highlighter and some pliers to help us shape the wire. Go for it. The top of the cable has to touch the middle of the battery, and the bottom has to touch the magnet. So now I'm taking the magnet and putting it at the bottom of the battery. What's next? I took the pliers to bend the copper wire, and then the copper wire is now bent so that it can touch the top of the battery. The other end of the wire is around the magnet. We're ready. Get ready to be amazed, Zoe. I'm ready. Wow, very cool. You can even make different shapes with the wire. Amazing. The electricity flows from the battery through the wire. That creates a magnetic field. When that connects to the magnet, there are two magnetic fields working together. The magnet makes the electricity change direction, which makes the wire spin. Thanks, Logan and Lex. Bye. 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 When they built the pyramids in ancient Egypt, they didn't have big machines or electricity, so I still haven't answered Owen's question yet. But Maddie has an interesting idea. Did aliens help build the pyramids? A flat Earth corner! Greetings, Earthlings. I am Zebo10 from Planet Zoe Dapolis. Knock, knock. Who's there? A dare. A dare who? I dare you to build a pyramid without our help. <laughs> the citizens of my planet built your pyramids on a weekend. We were bored. More, more! We wanted to make a giant toy on tiny planet Earth. We need no such thing as machines, but please send more of that strange round food called pizza. Mm, so yum, good. Yum, 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 yum. Yum. <laughs> Some people actually believe aliens built the pyramids because they don't think ancient Egyptians could have possibly done it 4,000 years ago. But can the answer really be aliens? I think I know who can answer this. <laughs> she can build all kind of things. Oh my gosh, look at those wings. Please welcome science teacher Megan Mueller. Wow, those are amazing. Did you build them yourself? Yes, I did. I wanted to make a really cool costume, so I used my engineering skills to build these wings. Do you want to see how they work? Of course. Go for it. OK. That's so cool. How did it do that? Oh, it's pretty simple, actually. This bar pushes and pulls these cables, which makes the wings open and close. Wow. When you came in here with the wings on, you looked like an alien. Maddie wanted to know if aliens helped build the pyramids in ancient Egypt. Well, we don't know that aliens actually exist. <gasps> so I don't think the aliens built the pyramids. <laughs> in fact, nobody really knows how they built the pyramids. Scientists have many ideas, but we can't prove them. 
However, we do know that the big cathedrals and the big castles were built using simple machines. What are simple machines? Simple machines are things that we humans can use to lift and move objects without putting in a lot of effort. Cool. Like this lever here. I can lift this using my own force and I don't have to break a sweat. <laughs> you try. Sure. Oh yeah, it is really easy. Oh, the big machines I use today, like the backhoe, had levers. Well, big machines are composed of lots of simple machines, but they have a motor with it. <laughs> What does this have to do with simple machines? I mean, I love seesaws. Well, actually, it is a simple machine. You see this board? This is a lever, and it rotates around the turning point or the fulcrum. A lever multiplies the force that I apply to it, which makes lifting you on this much easier. Yeah. <laughs> More! <laughs> The bicycle has a wheel and axle, which are also a simple machine. The axle passes through the center of the wheel and it holds the wheel to the bike while allowing the wheel to turn. But they hadn't invented wheels back in ancient Egypt. No, but they had a trick. Ancient Egyptians might have used logs just to move stones like that. Wow, that's super smart. Here is another simple machine called the inclined plane. Try it. Sure. We use inclined planes to help us move objects from a low spot to a high spot so that we don't actually have to lift them. Yeah, it was a lot easier than lifting it up the stairs. Hey, maybe ancient Egyptians used this to help them move huge stones. Maybe. <laughs> this is another simple machine. We call it a screw. It's basically an inclined plane that's wrapped around a cylinder. It allows us to move something up and down without taking up a lot of horizontal space. And we can also use it to hold things together, like the bottle and the cap. Cool. Another simple machine is this, an axe. Whoa, whoa, whoa. be careful. Don't worry, it's rubber. Oh. And <laughs> a wedge is used to cut open things, like this. Wow, the backhoe I used had teeth and it dug into the ground, kind of like a wedge. Yeah, that would do it. This is our last simple machine. Try it. You just pull it? Yeah, actually I think that's why it's called a pulley. A pulley allows us to lift heavy objects without putting in so much effort. Oh yeah, it is a lot easier than doing it by hand. <laughs> you know what makes it even easier? What? Adding a second pulley. Oh wow. This is a lot easier. If you could add more and more pulleys, eventually you could lift it with just your little finger. Really? Did you know that construction cranes also use pulleys? I got a question about that from Sharon. Why don't those big cranes follow me? Ow. Let's take a look at this model crane. If I were to pull on this, it will just fall over. Yeah. So I need to put some counterweights. I put one on the bottom, and you put one right here. Now you try. Hey, it's not falling. Yeah. Did you know that the crane got its name from the bird? Oh yeah, because it's so tall. Exactly. Speaking of birds, I've got to fly. Bye, Zoe. Bye. Wow, that was so cool. And. I think I finally know the answer to Owen's big question. How can they build those huge pyramids without using any machines? The big answer is... With simple machines. If we were building pyramids today, we'd use powerful big machines like bulldozers and excavators. They'd make it a lot faster. It would take a lot less people to do the job too. But experts and scientists think the Egyptians used simple machines, like levers, inclined planes, and wedges to help them build the massive pyramids. Simple machines have been around almost forever, so it makes sense the Egyptians would have used them. But because simple machines don't have motors or electricity, it took the Egyptians a really long time to build the pyramids. We done. 
I also found out that the big machines we use today are made up of a bunch of simple machines. And guess what? Even our bodies are like simple machines. Machine, machine, my body's a machine. Simple machines make my body run so clean. My knee is a pulley, it helps me run. My teeth are the wedges that chop off this burger bun. My elbow's a lever, just watch it lift. A wheel and axle shoulder is such a gift. Machines, my body has a few. You might even say this twisty hair is like a screw. Machine, machine, my body's a machine. Machine, machine, machine. I'm a machine. Wow, the construction of the rec center is really coming along. I, Bebo 10, could build that faster than you can say knock knock. Meet me. See you next time for more finding stuff out. Welcome to finding stuff out. I'm on a trampoline with a popsicle and earmuffs because of some questions I got. Starting with this one. Sorry, it's just a bit tricky to get my remote without dropping my... <sighs> popsicle. Is there anything left to discover or invent? I don't know, but by the end of the show, I'll find out. Meanwhile, I wish there was an invention that could keep me from dropping my popsicle while I click my remote, because I have another question. Not again. <sighs> you know, I'd like to invent something one day. Do kids invent things? Yes, kids do invent things. And that's why I'm jumping on a trampoline with earmuffs and popsicles. Because all three of those things were invented by kids. I found out that 15-year-old Chester Greenwood invented earmuffs in 1870 because his ears got cold when he went skating. Frank Epperson was only 11 when he invented popsicles. George Nissen was a teenager when he invented the trampoline, which he later taught a kangaroo to jump on with him. Jumping with a kangaroo wasn't an invention or a discovery, but it was pretty cool. And kids invented other amazing things too. Like glow-in-the-dark paper, braille that allows blind people to read, an invention that would later become a TV, or a flashlight that turns body heat into light. No batteries required. Okay. Maybe I can invent a hands-free way to hold my popsicle on the trampoline. Maybe not. But kids do invent stuff all the time, and we're going to meet some of them right now and see what their inventions are. This is a huge science fair. 500 kids who love science are here to show off their ideas, experiments, and inventions. And I'm going to meet some of them right now. Hi, Dylan. So what's your invention? My project's about generating power from the sun without using solar panels. The way I'm doing this is using mirrors. So the sun is hitting these mirrors, reflecting back, and creating a superheated spot. That's hot! My dish needs to be at, facing the sun at all times. So I developed my own active tracking software. Cool, but this needs to be bigger, right? Yes, my plan is to make a very large version. I have a three meter dish and a 14 foot arch on top of my roof and hopefully heat my hot water tank, my house and power my lights. Wow, free energy. Exactly, free energy. This is my passion and it feels amazing. It is amazing, good luck. Our next inventor made something that doesn't use the sun, but it definitely is out of this world. Hi. Hi, Zoe. My name is Anyang Kim, and I invented a glove that's for astronauts to use on Mars. Whoa. Since Mars is so dusty, my glove helps astronauts pick up their tools because basically they're blind on Mars. So there are sensors built into this glove, and when the sensors get close to an object, it sends signals to this small computer that makes the glove vibrate. Do you think NASA will want to use your invention? Yes, I think it's a good opportunity for NASA to use this glove when they go to Mars. Woohoo! Let's hope they do. Now here's an invention that you definitely don't need gloves to use. Hi. Gwe, my name is Deho Daniel Sky. I'm from a First Nations community called Gahnawage, and my project is the door pedal. The door pedal allows you to open up your door using your foot instead of your hands. Cool, but who uses it? 
I went to my local hospital and I allowed a nurse to try it out because there's lots of germs in the hospital. She said it was very sanitary because she doesn't have to touch the door handle anymore and also at my grandmother's convenience store. So now when she's bringing big, heavy things into her store, she can now just open it with her foot. This should open doors for me. Talk about using your head and your feet. And here's Tamit. He invented a wheel that can adjust to any road condition. You can see that the wheel is a complete circle right now. You can see it changes into something very, very spiky. I've spent many weeks, months on the computer screen trying to get my parts to fit together and when it finally did, when the wheel was finally able to turn and also change shape, it felt great. This really works well in sand, in snow, in mud, but then when you come back to a highway, you're able to press the button again and get it back to a circle. Well, that's like reinventing the wheel. Thanks. Now here are two people who also took a really old invention and made it into something new and amazing. Hi. Jenna and Elijah are Inuit and live in the far north in Saluit, none of it. That's uh, Inuit oil lamp. They worked out a way to use the heat of a traditional oil lamp and make electricity to charge a cell phone. Heat from Hulik, it makes electricity so you can charge when you're camping. So you never run out of power. Cool. That's a lot of inventions. But what about discovery? Here's a question from Michael. What is the difference between a discovery and an invention? Yeah. What's the difference? That's what I asked some of my friends. Ask a friend. An invention is something that you make, and a discovery is when you find something, but it's already made by nature. A discovery is when you find something new, and an invention is when you make something new. Well, I checked, and I found out you guys are right. Now, speaking of discoveries, here's a question from Daniel. What does Eureka mean? Well, Daniel, when I was trying to find out what Eureka means, I found this great story. So I made this animation. Archimedes was an ancient Greek mathematician, philosopher, engineer, astronomer, and inventor. Fortunately, despite being very busy, rumor has it he still took a bath regularly. The story is he discovered the principle of displacement when he noticed how the water level rose when he lowered his body into it. When he realized his discovery, he shouted out, Eureka! Which is the ancient Greek word for, I have found it. Archimedes also discovered that stuff that's less dense than water, like gases for instance, float to the surface instead of sinking to the bottom. We don't know how he discovered that, but you never know. <laughs> Eureka! Speaking of Eureka, I had an idea to put bouncy springs on my popsicle, so while I'm on the trampoline, you can bounce along with me. Oh no. If I can't invent a way, maybe I'll discover one eventually. I have discovered that kids have discovered a lot of cool things. When she was 10, Catherine Gray discovered a supernova. That's an exploding star. And Catherine is a bit of a star herself because she's the youngest person to ever discover a supernova. 15-year-old Tom Wagg discovered his own planet. And 15-year-old Willem Gattery may have discovered a lost Mayan city by using star maps. And lots of kids have discovered ancient fossils. Hey, cool! A dinosaur fossil! Here's a question from Mateus. Who found the first fossils of a dinosaur? The Flat Earth Corner! Oh, I wish I could find something really valuable down here, like gold. Hey, that's odd. There's something there. Forsooth, I found the bones of a dragon. Hey, I wonder if these bones would taste good in soup. I could be the first kid to invent dragon soup. <laughs> People who found the first dinosaur fossils thought they were the bones of dragons. 
I guess dinosaurs do sort of look like dragons, but it took a while for people to realize what they'd found. And it took a while for the grand prize winner of the science fair to discover a treatment that might help some people feel better. Hi Zoe, my name is Melissa, and I was able to make a discovery in many patients that had a type of cancer, a lymphoma, so it's a cancer of the blood cells. They're usually treated with something called chemotherapy. Then the cancer patient usually starts to feel really bad because that treatment kills your good and bad cells all at the same time. I wanted to develop a new method to help cancer patients so that they wouldn't become so weak. Wow. What inspired you to do that? I have an uncle who has cancer. I also have many friends who are related to other people who also have cancer. So it affects many people and I wanted to do something that would help a lot of people. I still have a lot more research to do and hopefully one day be able to really make this treatment available for everybody. Good luck. Thanks, Melissa. Now I'm going to meet some inventors who also had a very personal reason for making their inventions. This is Samantha Gway and Tegan Kit. They also wanted to invent something that would help people. Wow, this isn't like any other boot I've ever seen before. We were inspired to invent it by one of our friends who is almost always getting hurt. She has a lot of accidents. She fell off a trampoline once. She fell off her bike. And a fence. So I'm guessing this boot doesn't prevent injuries. What does it do? Our friend was always getting cast, and when she was going out in the rain, it would always get wet, so we wanted to make a boot so she didn't have to get her cast wet. And the whole cast can fit inside, and it just does up. To try it out, I put on some extra heavy socks so it'd be like I have a cast. Now you can put the boot on and see how it works. Cool, no laces. How does it feel? It's comfy. I could see how this could hold a cast. Ta-da! In the beginning, our invention was going to be on a shoe, but the shape wasn't right, so we picked a boot. And when we were making the boot, some of the glue wasn't strong enough, so we had to get new glue. And first, when we were doing it, we used magnets like this on one side and washers on the other side, but it wasn't strong enough, so we, we decided to use magnets on both, both sides. sides. Okay, now I'm going to put your boot to the test. So my foot won't get soaked? Not a chance. Definitely not. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit more daring. Hey, my foot isn't wet. That's awesome. It's actually meant for puddles, but it works in the shallow end. What's next for you inventors? We would like to add some reflectors to the boot to make it more safe at night. And add some cool designs to make it more fashionable. And we also have come up with a logo. Puddle jumpers, awesome. So Samantha and Tegan were inspired by trying to keep things dry. Now here's an invention created by someone who wanted to make sure people could get wet when they need to. Rachel Brower won medals at two science fairs, including a gold medal for her very watery invention. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Zoe. So what did you invent? So this is a water pasteurization system for third world countries. It removes the bacteria and impurities from water, making it safe to drink. What inspired you to make this? So a couple years ago, when I was 11, my family went hiking in New Hampshire. We saw the lakes and the rivers, but then we saw the contaminated do not drink signs. And at the same time, I was reading the I'm Malala book. And in this book, many women and girls are dying from the cholera outbreak. So I put the two things together and I decided I wanted to make a difference. Cool, so how does it work? So first the water is pumped from a water hole or lake, and then it runs through this basic cotton and charcoal filter system. Once um, it runs through the system, the two liter bottles are filled up, and then you would remove them from the system. What did you find difficult? So though the system removes the impurities, I found that bacteria is also found in water. 
That's when I designed this novel color-changing wax indicator. So once your two liter bottles are removed from the system, you'd place this inside and then place your bottles on a piece of corrugated tin roof. The sun will heat the water to 40 degrees Celsius and this blue wax will change from dark blue to light pink, indicating that the water's heating up. Then once that water reaches 60 degrees Celsius, this will melt and run into the second vial, indicating that the water is safe to drink. Wow, that's awesome. So what's next? And this summer, my system will be tested in Kenya and Pakistan. Do you have a message for kids who'd like to invent stuff? Find something you're passionate about, and just because you're a kid doesn't mean that you can't make a difference. Thanks for being on my show and showing us your invention. Now here's a question from Yasmina. How many discoveries and inventions are there in this world? How many inventions and discoveries are there? Let's see. Electricity, fire, air conditioning, toilet paper, the printing press, vaccines, head getting warm, refrigeration to keep heads from getting warm, eyeglasses, internet, jet engines, airplanes, helicopters, rocket, compasses, calendars, cars, radio, cranium getting hot, brain starting to overload, pasteurization, telephones, boat, motors, cars, radio, cranium getting hot, DVDs, drones, suitcase, okay, synapses firing like a laser, oh no! Ah! Yay. You're gonna make my head explode! The truth is, Nobody really knows how many inventions and discoveries there are because there have been so many throughout history. And this gives me an idea for a song. Inventions and discoveries, doing something new. They help us do things that we want to do. Like dreaming up a robot to help us clean our room. Create a kind of rocket to take us to the moon. from the sun, non-polluting cars, gloves that help you find your tools on Mars. Inventing and discovery, it's doing something new. Inventing and discovering will open doors for you. Inventing and discovering will open doors for you. Inventing and discovering will open doors for you. My great challenge! Today's challengers are Angelie and Logan. Yay. Versus Stefano and Sasha. Yeah. I'm gonna show you some weird inventions, and both teams have to guess what they are. If neither team gets the answer, you get a clue. The team that gets the most correct answers wins. You ready? Yeah. Okay, you girls are gonna go first. Okay. I don't. I think it's like for the baby to go inside. <laughs> and babies are bigger than this. So, like the new. We're going for how many? I guess. Okay. A hammock? Yeah. Sorry, girls, that's wrong. Boys, your turn. Uh, Don't see it. Oh, nice cat. Um, a bag of uh, litter for cats. Sorry, guys, that's not it. Okay, you guys get the clue now. It's it's a cat bed. Yeah. You guys were right. It's a bed for cats. Yes. What is it? Cheese shredder or it's something shredder? Yeah, it looks like it's a like a shredder. Yeah, it comes out from here. Yeah, is it like a shredder? Uh, Sorry guys, you're wrong. So I think it's something that you could put like a fruit or something inside. A uh, uh, fruit cutter, let's say. A cutter? Sorry guys, that's wrong as well. So you guys now get the clue. Um, a juicer. Yeah, you guys are right. Yeah. You put the lemon in and you squish it, it comes out. You hear that? Yeah, I hear it. Let's see how much juice it made. Oh, you spilled some. What is it? Uh, it has to be like a decoration for something. <laughs> I don't think so. It's something that we... Used to clean a toilet or something? A drain? Sorry, girls, that's wrong. OK, you, you guys think? go. But could it be a decoration? Because this could be the hair. This is a little like. No, why would it be a doll? <laughs> but can't you see? Does this look like a doll's hair? Ooh. Hey guys, I need an answer. A decoration. A decoration. decoration? Sorry guys, that's also wrong. Okay, now you guys get the clue. Oh, it's a potato smasher? You guys are right. When it's baked, you mash it. Oh, I know what it is. It's like one of these old fashioned bells, hold on. Yeah, I don't think it's a bell. Yeah, there's no like ball inside. Let's uh, put the ball inside. Um, I need a final answer. <laughs> what did a, I say? A bell? I think. Sorry, guys. That's wrong. It's our turn. Um, is it to take out a core of an apple? Nope. You guys get the clue. 
Maybe a lighter? No, impossible because there's no fire thing in magic. Yeah, but you could put like you could put something in a lighter for candles. Sorry girls, it's not it. Uh, oh maybe maybe Is it to take out the light? Yeah, you guys are right. Yes. You use this to put out a candle without burning your fingers. Alright. Okay, both teams have two points. So this is the tiebreaker. What is it? Um a measuring magnet? A measuring magnet? Sorry girls, that isn't it. There's circles on it. Could it could be a tracer? Is it a tracer? Sorry guys, that's not a tracer. So you guys now get the clue. Oh my god. It's the whole it's a tool. Um, is it to, um, is it like uh, to measure the pasta? You guys are right, it wins! Yes! yes. <laughs> what you do is you put it in, and that's how you measure it for three people. That's cool, I need that at home. <laughs> well, thanks for being on my show and helping me find stuff out. Now, time to answer the question that inspired my show today. Is there anything left to discover or invent? The big answer is... Well, Anthony, to answer your question, I've decided to ask someone who's gone all the way to space to discover things. Astronaut Chris Hadfield. Chris, thanks for being on my show. So, do you have an answer to Anthony's question? Is there anything left to invent or discover? Zoe, we have no idea what we're doing. We are just getting started. We don't know what 94% of the universe is even made of. We are just infants. <laughs> there are so many problems that we need to solve, and we're counting on scientists and engineers and bright young people like you and, and like people right across the country and around the world to solve those problems. So there's a whole world of things to discover and learn from and improve the quality of life with. Thanks, Chris. Well, that's my show for today. By the way, notice anything different? I finally invented a popsicle holder that lets me use my remote and take my earmuffs off. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out, the show where I search for your answers, no matter how shocking they are. And you might be wondering why I'm walking on this red carpet. Well, it's not like I was nominated for an award or anything, but if you wanted to nominate me, that would be totally awesome. Actually, the reason I'm walking around on this carpet is because I'm trying to answer a question about a mysterious form of energy. So if my calculations are correct and I've shuffled just enough... Ouch! <laughs> that was more than I expected. Must have been the shoes. Anyway, let's start off with a question. <clears throat> Sorry, I forgot to turn the monitor on. That's better. It's from Lucia. Why does my hair stick to my chair? The short answer is... It's caused by a powerful force of nature. And today, I'll find out what that powerful force is and how to use it to make the kids of today superheroes. So now I have to find out why your hair sticks to your chair. It's probably something sticky. I guess the mysterious force isn't peanut butter. This calls for an investigation and another question. This one's from Steven. Would you need electricity if cavemen didn't then they survive? Here's an animated clip I made that should shed some light on your question. True, cavemen didn't have electricity, but they did have another form of energy, fire, which back then wasn't easy to make. <sighs> they could use it to cook and dry their clothes, or even as a light to read by. And for millions of years, fire served as a cheap substitute for family entertainment. Oh no, Kronk's favorite show, preempted by Weather Network. Staying warm, cooking food, and entertaining ourselves are just some of the things that we use electricity for. Now here's a question. 
Why do so many things run on electricity? From the world of physics, please welcome my special guest, Mark Nantel! Hi! Hi! Oh. Ah, the mysterious force! So why do so many things run on electricity? Well, I mean, for very different reasons. In the case of light, it's just cleaner, and it's, it's more efficient, mm -hmm. and it's safer. Uh, in the case of a drill, a hand drill, you can put it in a battery and go anywhere you want. In the case of the watch, well, you know, you don't want to have to wind your watch all the time, and no, sometimes you forget. It's a, pain. it's a pain. Well, the electric one works pretty much all the time for a long time. So that's why a lot of things work on electricity, essentially. And you know, Harrison, this makes light, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it makes a lot of light, and it's great, but it's not very efficient. Yeah. Now, this little guy is very efficient. Oh. It doesn't take hardly any electricity to light up. Cool. Let me find a battery. Uh, don't worry about it. I have everything we need in this lemon. Ah. Yeah, I'll show you. We'll make a battery with lemon. Okay. The lemon juice can be what's called an electrolyte. An electrolyte is something that is used in batteries to carry electricity from one side of the battery to the other side of the battery. So, you take a lemon, you make a little slit in it. On, in the slit, you put a penny, and then you put a nail on the other side. Well, what you have here is essentially a little mini battery. Now, if you want to be clever, you make several of these guys, and then you can connect them in a row. Mm. So, yeah, you take one side to the penny, the other side of the alligator clip goes to the nail. Okay. And you continue like that for a while, and the more lemons you put, yeah. the more power you get. So let's try to make it like this with a four lemon battery. Let's see if it works. It works! Ta-da! So now there's a better saying. When life hands you lemons, don't make lemonade. Make a battery. Now here's a question from Joshua. How do we make electricity? How do we make electricity? Well, Joshua, I think we already answered your question. There's a huge pile of lemons somewhere, the size of a mountain, along with some pennies and nails, right? Well, not exactly. There are other ways to make electricity. Um, typically, you send something through a, a propeller of some kind. Mm -hmm. As it goes through, it gives electricity, and the electricity, in this case, can power yeah. The little light bulb, right? It could be wind. Sometimes you can put water and have it go down through a bunch of turbines. This is a fancy word for propellers. Okay. And then the, the propellers are connected to a generator and at the end comes out electricity. Sometimes when you don't have water and you don't have wind, you may want to generate your own by boiling water and making steam, like steam? really high pressure. Yep. And then you pass that through your propeller. And though, how do you make the steam? You can use nuclear power, or you can decide to burn fossil fuels like mm -hmm. coal or petroleum or natural gas. But uh, another way you can do power that doesn't involve steam or nuclear power or anything are some maybe more uh, sustainable ways, using what the Earth already gives you. Something like geothermal. So the Earth is hotter inside the Earth. Yeah. So if you dig a hole in the Earth, it's hotter than at the top. So you can actually get some of the heat that's there in order to help you generate electricity but also you can use the tides. So if you go at high tides, you make sure there's water somewhere, and when tide becomes lower, all the water comes back down to go to the sea, and that's when you make it go through propellers again and turbines. So no matter how you make the turbine turn, it generates electricity. And the other way you could do it is using solar panels. So mm -hmm. the sun is always there, it's shining on the earth anyway, it's wasting a lot of energy. Let's imagine this is the sun, right? Okay. All right, well, it's, yeah, just imagine. And we light this up, Watch it. Yay! There's your car. So we generated electricity that powered the little car just from the solar panel that's on its back. No turbine needed. So until we're using things that don't create pollution, how do we cut down on it? You could use less electricity. That's the best way. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have lights on in the house that you don't need to have on, turn it off. You could still leave the TV on if you're watching this show, though. Yeah. Now here's a question from Kirsten. How does electricity travel through wires? Imagine that a wire is this tube. Just like those marbles yeah. slide from one end of the tube to the other, when you turn a switch, all of a sudden, the electricity goes to where it's needed. If you turn off the switch, it stops. Turn on the switch, it goes. So what are the marbles supposed to be? Well, they're kind of an analogy to uh, electrons. Okay. Electrons are little bits, the smallest bits of electricity you can find. Cool, that was very illuminating. 
Thanks for being on my show, Mark. No problem, my pleasure. Speaking of moving electricity down a wire, it's time for... My Great Challenge! So Shishana and Olivia take your position to get ready to compete. Woo! In real life, we have to move electricity long distances from where we make it to where we use it. So today, my great challenge is about moving electricity from one place to another. So you have to get the power from the batteries all the way up to the caveman who's holding the light bulbs, and the first one of you to get it all the way up to the caveman will be the winner. And here's the tricky part. You have to use these wires and other stuff, but none of it is long enough to run from our batteries to our caveman's light. So you have to figure out what you can connect to the wires to carry current all the way between these streetlights and our cavemen. Here's a hint. Some of our materials are called conductors, meaning that electrons can flow through them. Others are called insulators, meaning that electrons can't flow through them. When I touch these wires together, a buzzer will go off and that's your signal to start. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a worm on this one. Olivia starts with the toy worm. It's made out of rubber, so the light won't go on. Rubber does not conduct electricity. It's an insulator. Shoshana tries out the steel wool. Will it work? Yes, I got one. Yes! Metal is a great conductor of electricity. Electrons easily move through it. And now Olivia is doing the same. Shoshana is trying out the light stick. Uh-oh. It may let up inside, but the outside is plastic. Another insulator. Olivia doesn't seem to be using anything plastic anymore. That metal wire works. Oh. Stay. Yep, that knitting needle is also metal. Ugh. Shoshana's catching up. They're tied now. They're both down to their last light, and Olivia's putting the pedal to the metal with aluminum foil. Oh, the caveman's torch is lit up. We have a winner. Olivia, congratulations. Congratulations. So what would you do if there was no electricity? Well, I would probably scream and run and cry. I will use like a lemon and dime and penny to light the little light. I'd play the drums. Yeah, I like this guy. <laughs> I just practiced my dancing. To be honest with you, I don't really care if there's electricity or not. I would just use a candle and just live my life. I do like Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Edison did learn on how to do it, or I just use my dog to tug me to school on my scooter. <laughs> I'll scream and die. <laughs> no electricity? My show wouldn't exist. <laughs> That means you guys wouldn't be able to see me. <laughs> How come electric eels don't electrocute themselves? Yeah, that's weird. How come electric eels don't electrocute themselves? Now that is mysterious. I've never thought of that before. An animal that makes electricity shocks other things but doesn't shock itself with electricity that it makes inside of its own body? That's shocking! You're gonna Yay! make my head explode! To find out more about electric eels, Whoa! I met up with Nicole Can at the aquarium. An eel? That's not creepy enough. It has to be an electric eel. So, how do these things work anyway? Do you have to plug them in? No, not at all. These electric eels can be found in the muddy waters of South America, and they generate electricity to stun their prey and to scare their predators, the things that want to eat them. Okay, let me get out of here. <laughs> Ugh, why would you want to eat an electric eel anyway? And how do they make electricity? Well, on the back of their tail here, they actually have very specialized cells called electrocytes. And when they all fire at once, that's what creates the electric charge. Okay, so to answer Jamie's question, how come they don't electrocute themselves? The truth is, Nobody knows. There's a couple of theories out there. Some people think that maybe they're immune to electricity, or maybe they just have all of their vital organs insulated from that charge. Are they the only animals that make electricity? 
No, don't tell me sharks make electricity too. They're already dangerous enough with their teeth. Okay, well they don't actually make electricity, but they can detect it. They have special cells underneath their snouts, and all those cells do is they detect bioelectricity. So that's the electricity that any living thing makes, whether it's a fish or a person. Wait, did you just say a person? Yep. Dun dun dun! Now my head really is going to explode. If my head's going to explode, maybe I should go see Dr. Joe Macker. He's a neuroscientist. This is just one of Dr. Macker's friends. So I heard that sharks can detect electrical activity in humans, and I was wondering if it's really true that we can make electricity inside of our own bodies. Yes, that's absolutely true. And in fact, our brains can use as much electricity as a 60 watt light bulb. In fact, I can even show you that electrical activity in action in your brain right now. This is Harrison, our brain, and he's ready to be measured up. Hi. So Chantal's measuring your head and marking the spots where uh, the wires that we're going to attach to your head are going to go. They need to be on exactly the right spots above the right part of your brain. People always want to pick my brain, but this is ridiculous. Um, are these going to suck my brain out? No, but they will let us see the electrical activity of your brain. OK. My mom always thinks I'm wired. Now I'm actually wired. <laughs> that doesn't hurt, does it, Harrison? No, it's just really cold, though. Oh, it helps you keep a cool head. <laughs> this is what a bowl of spaghetti must feel like. OK. Great, so now Chantal is going to start the electroencephalogram, or EEG. So I'm ready. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes now. The first test is to check out what happens if I keep my eyes closed, and then open them. For the uh, next part, I'm going to place this light, which will flash at you, and you'll need to close your eyes for this. OK, we're done. That was really weird. It was like the lights. And I like kind of wanted to open my eyes while they were like going, but I knew I wasn't supposed to, so I didn't. And it was just really weird. <laughs> it's time to see if I'm really full of energy. Yes! Check out my brain waves. That's electricity. So here, this is when you had your eyes closed and everything is nice and calm. And if yeah. I just move forward a little bit. Wow. Yep, right there where the yellow uh, yeah. blob is, that's when you open your eyes and suddenly uh, there's a lot more going on. Yeah, I really lit up. <laughs> you certainly did. OK, and here we're showing you the results of the flashing light that you had. Each of these pink spikes represents the flashing light coming on and off. And as you can see, as soon as we start flashing that light at you, the activity in your brain changes completely. Yeah, it was really big and wavy there, and then as soon as the light came on, it was really small. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's true, my brain does generate electricity, but what do you use this for? Oh, uh, well, we can use this to uh, help people with epilepsy. In epilepsy, certain parts of the brain are firing when they shouldn't be, and so we can see that with this machine, and now we can even implant a device called a pacemaker into their brain, which regulates the activity so it's back to the way it should be firing. Wow, so electricity can actually correct people's problems. When you know what you're doing with it, yes. Well then, maybe you can answer this question from one of our viewers. Um, why don't grown-ups um, let kids um, touch electricity? That's a very good question. Um, in part, it's because the amount of electricity flowing within our brains is thousands of times less than what's in the wall. And also, when it's flowing from one part of our body to another, that's safe. It's dangerous when electricity comes out from outside our body and goes through us. Yeah, that's an electric shock. Exactly. So remember, kids, don't play around with electricity that comes out of wall sockets, or you'll get socked with shocks. Yar, har, har, oh. The Flat Earth Corner! In the 16th century, we've made huge medical advances. That's why we know that if you're suffering from certain ailments, like gout, there's a simple cure. Just stick your feet in a tub of electric eels. Whoa! What a wonderful treatment! The electric shocks hurt so much I can't even think about my gout! 
few hundred years ago, doctors used to think if you suffered from headaches or an illness called gout, like Henry VIII, King of England, that you could be cured by sticking your foot into a tub of electric eels. Nowadays, we know that electric eels can't cure anything, except maybe boredom. I guess that's why Dr. Macker didn't have any in his lab. But speaking of Dr. Macker in his lab, it's time for... Uh-oh, do try this at home. So, as I found out from Dr. Macker, your heartbeat and many other things inside of your body have electrical impulses. So to feel how that happens, place your fingers on your wrist like so. Can you feel that pulse? That's your heart pumping blood all around your body, which is controlled by tiny electrical signals. And more signals to help you keep your balance, all because of electrical impulses. You've got electricity flowing through your whole body from cell to cell at awesome speed. You've got electricity when you're looking with your eyes, when you're smelling with your nose, when you're figuring some math, when you're wiggling your toes, when you're doing funky moves, or when you start to sneeze. You've got electricity. Yeah, you've got electricity flowing through your whole body from cell to cell at awesome speed. You've got electricity. What's lightning? What an electrifying question. I checked, and it's a lot like rubbing a balloon against the wall, except with way more electricity. During a storm, water droplets and clouds rub together, causing friction. This friction causes electrons, which have a negative charge, to build up inside the clouds. The Earth is positively charged. In this case, opposites attract. Eventually, the attraction is too strong, and zap! There's your lightning. It's what's called static electricity. It's exactly what happens when I rub my feet on a carpet. The friction causes the negatively charged electrons to build up in my body. The electrons have nowhere to go until I put my finger close to the positively charged chair. Then bam! I get a shock, which is like a mini bolt of lightning. Which leads me back to the original question from Lasaya. Why does my hair stick to my chair? The big answer, Lasaya, is... The electrons! It's like a tiny version of lightning. When your hair rubs against your chair, it's picking up electrons from it. It's the same when I'm rubbing this balloon against my sweater. This creates negative and positive charges to build up. And that force causes my balloon to stick to my sweater. Cool, my own electric eel balloon animal. I think he likes me. Let's get this party started. How about some pointy teeth? Well, I guess that's goodbye to Mr. Eel. Thanks for watching Finding Stuff Out. See you next time. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> Let the force be with you.